Oh, look, it's working. Ooh, I feel fancy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Mike. Uh, this is the first time I'm trying this. We'll see how it goes. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about how I make my magic sheets in Adobe InDesign and um, wrote a couple of blog articles about it here and there and, and kind of showed it to a lot of people, but I've never actually done one live, so that's going to be what this is. Um, I am going to make it available on my YouTube channel after uh, it's all done. This could be incredibly boring, and I apologize if it is. Feel free to tune out um, the chat. I also have open, so if you have questions that come up throughout the thing, please feel free to uh, put them in, and I will try to get to them right away. Um, also, if you can't hear what I'm saying, please say something in the chat. All right, so I'm going to take my face away now because I don't like that. Great. Um, so I use Adobe InDesign uh, to make my magic sheets, uh, which some people have asked me, why don't I use Vectorworks? And really, the, the only real reason I have for that is because uh, Vectorworks is great at what it does. It's a uh, drafting tool. Um, I use it to draft plots, to do all kinds of paperwork. Um, but when it comes to a magic sheet, I want it to be something that's a little more visually appealing or a little bit, I want to have a little more control over how I style things. And Vectorworks just is not designed to be a, a you know, graphic layout design type tool. Um, that's not to be said you can't do a magic sheet in Vectorworks. Obviously, some of the you know biggest designers in the world and their associates and assistants do their magic sheets in Vectorworks and they look awesome and they work. Um, it, it really is whatever works for you. So InDesign just works for me. Um, so I'll show you a couple of quick examples here before we really dive in. Um, I do have on my website at mikewoodld.com uh, slash magic sheets, I do have some examples of, uh, of some and also kind of a little write up of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, well, this is kind of an example of, of, of what it is. Um, so I'm, I'm, I won't do too much of like, you know, lighting theory with this. This is going to be really just about how to do what you see in front of you. Um, but if you don't know what Magic Sheet is, it's essentially just a simplified version of the plot that shows me all of my lights, all of my systems, all on one piece of paper so that I can take this one piece of paper and have it at the tech table and not have to have the plot and be flipping around with a bunch of different pieces of paper. So I might take uh, you know anywhere from one to ten pages of a light plot, condense them down into this one page. So um, I kind of have a similar visual style to a lot of mine. Uh, they all end up looking very similar. Um, and it just helps me a lot because going from show to show, from venue to venue, having some somewhat of a, a, a unified way of doing things really helps the workflow. So um, I'm going to do two things first. I'm going to open up a previous one so I can grab some objects from it. Um, so I've just opened InDesign here. Um, InDesign is part of the Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, I think you can get it as a standalone, oops, a standalone product as well. Um, but I have the Adobe Creative Suite, and it, it's one of the programs in there. Um, and we're also going to start, with, for, start from scratch here. So I'm going to file new document. I'm going to do my best today to not use any keyboard shortcuts so that you can see exactly where I'm clicking around on the screen. Um, and if I start doing, if I do something kind of, it appears magically, say something in the chat so I know to go back and explain it. Um, so in my document setup here, I'm going to choose inches. And I typically will do uh, tabloid size, which is 11 by 17. I'm setting a height there, one page, uh, landscape orientation, and then I uncheck the facing pages thing. And if we, if this magic sheet ends up being two pages, I'll show you why uh, later. Um, I don't do any columns or margin settings here, um, and I'll show you why right now. So I click create, and I'm kind of given this new blank document. The purple magenta line around the outside uh, represents the margin of the page. Um, I don't really deal with the mar I don't really care about the margins too much with this because a lot of times I'm kind of just sh shrinking them to fit when I print. It, the scale of this doesn't super matter. Um, the reason I don't set up the margins right away is because it's easier to do it once you've already got the base document set up. So I've got this base document ready to go. And I'm going to go here to layout, margins, and columns. And now as I'm changing things around, and design just updated, so it's giving me tips. As I'm changing things around on this window, I can actually see them happening live, which is nice. So I usually make that pretty small. And typically I'll do four or five columns, um, probably five for this because there's a decent amount of lights in this show. And the gutter size is the space between those columns. So I don't, you know, I try to give it a little bit of a gap, um, try to make it look kind of as even as possible all the way around um, and call that good. Okay. So now I've got, I mean, the document is ready to go. This is basically a, a tabloid piece of paper. I've got rulers at the top and at my side over here. 
um, and I can start putting things in here right away. One thing I do usually do is I'll put a guideline in in each column. So to do that, I'm clicking on the ruler and just dragging over. And if you're doing this uh, yourself, you feel kind of as you get to that center of that column, it kind of has, it has an anchor to it, so it'll lock into place. Um, so I'm gonna do that in each one of my columns feel that lock in place. And what that allows me to do is basically as I'm adding uh, objects to these columns, they'll, they'll, I'll be able to align them center without having to use a bunch of extra tools, which is nice. I um, don't really do any horizontal guides because um, I don't know how big my boxes are going to be yet. Uh, but that's basically the setup. So now I've got a, a blank document ready to go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save this so that if my computer crashes in the middle of this or something happens, I don't... Um, don't lose anything. So this is going to be, uh, well, I guess I should have prefaced with what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm doing this Magic Sheet for production of South Pacific um, that I'm working on. I actually go into tech next weekend for down in Atlanta at the City Springs uh, Theater Company. So I'm going to make a new folder here. I'm going to call that Magic Sheet. Jessica can yell at me for not numbering that folder later. Um, South Pacific Magic Sheet. So now I've got it saved. Great. Um, so going back to a second, before I kind of start creating objects in here, I'm going to look at this previous one from the last show we did at City Springs uh, of Elf and kind of deconstruct it a little bit here for you and show you what uh, what these little boxes are made up of. So I'm going to just delete some of them to give myself some space to work in here. Um, but essentially, all you're seeing on this screen is a series of, of objects. So some of them are text boxes, some of them are, are graphic objects like images. Um, I've got the background of my theater here, but every single one of these boxes I can manipulate and move around um, and do whatever I want with. Um, I've spent time in the past kind of creating these boxes with strokes and fills and things like that, and so now I kind of copy paste them into my different drawings, but I'll show you how to, how to do that from scratch as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the important thing to know about how InDesign works is, uh, it, you know, it's typically used as a program for laying out magazines or newspapers or, you know, publications of some kind. So sometimes when you're dealing with something like that, you don't necessarily know uh, what content you're going to have in, in any given frame. So you know you're going to have an image, but you don't know what size it's going to be. Or I should say, you, will, you might know what size it's going to be, you just don't know exactly what the content's going to be. So... Um, uh, InDesign uses what are called what we call frames to hold different graphic objects. So these the blue line around this represents the frame, and you can see kind of as I drag this out, this frame out, I'm revealing more and more uh, of the of the object behind it. So if I go like this, it looks like I'm cropping that uh, the image, but I'm actually not cropping the image. That image is still fully intact back there. And for those of you who are, have a drafting background, you can almost kind of think of this as like a, a viewport or a window through to that object behind. Um, if I double click on it, you can see now I have a red box and now I'm manipulating the object inside. I'm gonna use the arrow keys here. I'm manipulating my object inside of that frame. So as I move it around, um, you know, I, I'm not seeing anything. It's almost like I'm masking off the areas I don't wanna see. Um, there's a couple of uh, great uh, tools to use for this. If you know you have a square object, so he here's a good example with this gobo. If I know this gobo is a square and I know I'm going to make this smaller, I can go ahead and by holding down shift, I can make this frame smaller. And if I right click on it and go to fitting, I can uh, fit my content to the frame or I can fit frame to content. And of course, there's keyboard shortcuts for those. Uh, and I also have a, a Stream Deck device that I have mapped to a lot of these things. So a lot of things that I use frequently, I have on little hotkeys there. So I do that, and now you see that the content in there has resized itself to fit that frame. And again, if I double click on the content, I could, using the red handle, start zooming that in and out. I could rotate it around. I could do all kinds of different things, but it's still going to be constrained within that frame, which is pretty cool. Uh, these arrows are the same thing. It's just a... a clip art I found of an arrow and have been using for a while. Um, I use those to show direction with things. Um, doo -doo -doo. And then my text boxes here. So a lot of questions I get, uh, or what, are, what does the bold underline mean? What does the italics mean? Ital so the, basically it's just a way of how I denote my groups. So an entire group, let me zoom down here. For So let's look at this front light uh, system here, for example. Uh, my entire group, so channels 181 through 193, 
is group number 181. So that's denoted by the bold and underline. And then if I want subgroups in that, so if I just want the downstage lane, I know that that's group 185. If I want the midstage lane, I know that that's group 190. Sometimes, uh, you know, things like this, like the footlights down here, uh, obviously that's only one row. I do it still because when I'm in the heat of the moment in tech, I, I never quite know where my mind or my eyes are going to go. So I might say group 701, group 705, just based on what I had selected before that or something, and I'll kind of, it, I, I just like to have both of them in there. Sometimes if it's a single group like that, especially if it's a, a row of lights, like a strip light or something like that, I'll make this number be the, the group in a reverse order. So group 701 would be channel 701 through 705, and group 705 would be channels 705 through 701. So anyway. Uh, oh, cool, there's a question here. Uh, so Martin asks, uh, why do I choose InDesign over Illustrator? Uh, well, uh, InDesign is, well, Illustrator is designed to create, create, um, create things, create illustrations, create drawings, to actually draw things in, whereas InDesign is designed to create layouts and it's almost, it's, it's basically just a publishing tool. So if I was going to draw this magic sheet by hand or I was going to draw my theater, well, that's a bad example because I use Vectorworks for that. Um, but uh, it's just different tools for different purposes, I guess, is the best answer to that question. Okay, so back to my South Pacific uh, magic sheet here. Um, let me put in my cheat sheet real quick. So uh, I have a cheat sheet here that I've created in advance. And basically what this cheat sheet is, is it's a schedule of all of my lights sorted by channel order make that a little bigger for you so you can see it. Actually, let me just do this. Sorry, like I said, this is my first time, so I'm getting used to this program. Um, uh, it's in channel order and color order and it has a purpose. So this is uh, kind of just like a way that I can quickly figure out what lights I need to put in what systems on this magic sheet. Um, channel number wise, just the, num the numbers that I like to use. Um, I've been criticized for it, but oh well. Uh, it's, uh, I, I wrote a little bit about it also on my blog recently, you can check that out. Um, but each, you can see each system of light has a, has a numbering to it, has an order to it. Um, and I kind of use this cheat sheet now as almost like a checklist as I start going through the actual creation of the magic sheet. Um, so let me go back up to the first page, get that out of the way. So before I can, uh, really jump in here and, um, and start placing objects and I have to go in and I have to get, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that was still there. I have to go in and I have to get a background image of my stage. So you can see in the elf magic sheet here, I've got this little object that has the, the grayed out background image of my stage in it. So I'm gonna do the same thing for South Pacific. Um, so I've already got that open in Vectorworks here. Uh, this plot was drafted by uh, Jess Krager, um, who, I don't know if she's watching or not, she's not heckling me yet, she might be, who knows. Uh, but she drafted this, um, and you can see, like, there's, you know, all the lights, all the positions are on here, all this stuff is on here that I don't necessarily need if I just want a ground plan of my stage. Um, this particular show was interesting because we rented the whole scenery package, and because of that, we don't really, you know, our, our team, our lighting team, were the ones who kind of helped figure out where the scenery was going to go in the space and, and did that drafting. So there's not really scenic ground plans or anything that are not ours that I can just pull from. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is, in Vectorworks here, I'm going to take my square object, and I'm going to draw a square kind of over, I'm gonna keep the apron, in, I'm not gonna keep the apron in this one, kind of over the space like this. I'm gonna to go to view, I'm gonna edit, excuse me, no, I'm gonna to go to view, I'm gonna create a viewport, and I'm gonna put that on a new sheet layer. Um, what it's labeled, what it's numbered, really doesn't matter for this, um, because it's just gonna be used to create this, uh, this image. So I'm going to deselect that, and now the main reason I do that is so that I have a white background and I don't have to worry about changing my vector work settings or anything to have the white background to begin with. So first thing I'm going to do, if anybody knows how to do this by default, please tell me. 2019 or 2018 added these viewport annotations in by default, and I hate it. Um, so I usually just go in and delete it, but if anybody knows it, if it, or there's a way to turn that off, please let me know. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to turn off layers that I don't need. Uh, so really all I need here is the scenic ground plan layer. So I'm going to turn off the lighting layers. I'm going to leave the venue on. I didn't make this drawing, so I'm not sure what's in it. And that's pretty decent. That's really all I need for my background image. Uh, and now I'm just going to do a screenshot. 
So I have it on my Mac, I have Command Shift 4 uh, mapped to be a screen selection screenshot tool. And I'm going to just drag a square kind of over top of the immediate area that I want, like that. And now it's copied to my clipboard. Oh, thank you, Harrison. I'm going to look for that later. Harrison says there is a setting where I can disable that. So good. I should have probably asked that two years ago when I started being annoyed by it. Anyway, uh, so now I'm going to paste that graph again, and you can see it's pasted in at full scale. It's very large. Obviously, I don't want it to be that big. So this is where when I was talking earlier about uh, resizing your frames and resizing your objects and stuff where that comes into being important. Um, one thing you probably do notice, and I guess it depends on the stream quality here, is that the quality of this image kind of looks bad. Um, and that's okay. It's actually in there in high quality. InDesign will automatically change the rendering quality to help you move around in the program faster and to help conserve resources. So if I wanted to see this crystal clear, I could right click on it and down here, oh, excuse me, under display performance, I can choose fast display, typical, or high quality. So um, if I choose high quality, now it's back and it's going to render it. Well, well, Okay, I don't know why it didn't. It should have rendered it in um, in a better display, but it's going to be small enough where the text doesn't really matter anyway. So, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of anchor this up into this first corner here, and I'm going to hold down Shift so that my uh, aspect ratio is maintained, and I'm going to bring it in until it fits, that frame fits perfectly inside of one of these boxes. So you can see now width-wise, it's exactly there. But again, the issue is that uh, the content inside of there, I can move it all around, it's still way too big. So I'm going to use that shortcut I showed you before where I say fitting, fit content to frame, and now I've got my whole stage in there and it's good to go. Um, once I have it in there, I'm, I'm never going to need this upstage area here, so I'm going to bring in my frame and kind of crop it off a little bit, and I'm even going to crop off part of my pit here. So now I have a, a great ground plan. But I can move around, um, zoom in a little bit here. I can move around and I can, I can start dropping other objects on top of. So I'm going to come back into this uh, magic sheet real quick and I'm going to grab, um, I'm just going to grab some objects. So I'm going to grab all of these guys, I'm going to copy them, and I'm going to paste them in here. So all of my text boxes um, all are black with a white stroke around them. And the reason I have the white stroke around all the text is because when you put that on top of an object, especially an object that has black or gray behind it, you don't want that text to start becoming, you know, run into that other line. It'll be visually uh, confusing. So to do that, once I have the text selected, if I, uh, if I have it actually selected inside the text box like this, or if I grab it and then choose my text tool over here on the left, um, you can see this is where I can choose a font, I can choose a style, um, I can do uppercase, all those things. Right here under color, this is where I choose, grab it, this is where I choose uh, the color of my text, and then right behind it here is where I choose the color of the stroke. So if you hover over these two little things here, you can see there's a fill color and there's a stroke color. Um, so stroke is white or paper, um, when it says paper, it's going to be, you know, obviously our paper is white, so it's just not going to have any, any ink there. I could change that stroke to be magenta if I wanted to, which I don't want to. Um, you can also do that here, but I don't, I usually just do it right here. So I'm going to do that paper. Great. So I've got those text boxes, um, set up. Same thing as before. I can make this text box any size I want. Um, undo that. I have it set to be three digits because 99% of my channel numbers that I use on my shows are three digits long. Usually if I have a four digit channel number, it's a hot power or something like that and I don't need that on the magic sheet. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring this box in and you can see on that other magic sheet, oh, I did five columns before. So the columns are exactly the same as the other one that was completely accidental. Um, I've got a title for what that is. I've got a little color bar here. I usually put what kind of light is in that system just for simplicity's sake so I know what I'm looking at. So the first group I'm going to do, if I come back over here to my um, cheat sheet, my first thing is going to be my top LEDs. So if I go to the plot for a second here, you can see in my plot, uh, where am I at? My overhead plot. 
Then I have uh, color source pars as my top lights, and there's five of them across. One, two, three, four, five by one, two, three, four deep. So back here in InDesign, I'm going to label this top LEDs. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting that that is there. Let me get rid of that for you. There we go. Um, I'm going to label that top LEDs, and I'm going to say these are color source pars. Now, this is something that, uh, you know, most of the lights in these shows that I do at this theater are all, almost all LEDs. So almost everything changes color, so that's why you see a lot of gray bars here. I don't really like the rainbow bar that a lot of people do, it's just a personal preference. Um, if I do have a system that is a particular color, like you see here, I will color, sorry, I do color that bar with kind of the equivalent of that color, and I'll show you how to do that in a bit. Um, okay, so first thing I'm going to do, I said five across, so I'm going to grab, I've got three objects here. These are the only three numbers I really need. I need one that's a full group number, which is again the bold with underline. I need a regular plain text one, and then I need my italicized one. I'm going to start by placing the center, downstage center one first. So here's 252. I'm going to place that right there. I'm going to go ahead and change the number to be three. So that's my third light. So now, even though I only have one digit in this box, I keep the box, the text box size the same. And the reason for that is because when I start copy pasting these, you'll see like this first one is gonna take the longest to set up. And then once I start, once I have one, I just copy paste it into other ones. Um, I, I don't wanna have to go ahead and resize my boxes every time. And if for some reason I had to rechannel something, it would be easier just to change the box. It will just change the text this way instead of changing the boxes. So I'm gonna copy paste that and I'm just using Command C, Command V for that. I know I said I wasn't going to use shortcuts, but oh well. That's two, and then that would make this one four. And again, it's only this first one that takes more time to set up. So now to do one and five, I'm going to use these guys here because they already are styled the way I want them. Put that here, and put this one here. So there, now I have my first set of lights. Now, this is kind of uh, exaggerated because if you look at the five, if I zoom in on that five, you can see that that channel is kind of off into the portals here. Um, but when I'm looking at this in the moment, it, it's fine. Uh, it's really just about knowing where the light is hitting. I know just by looking at this exactly where things are. Uh, whoops, I hit the wrong uh, shortcut. Uh, to, to go back just to selection tool, it's keep, uh, keyboard shortcut is V for that. Um, that's this guy right here. So now I'm going to move these a little bit. So if I marquee select these, you can see that I've also selected the image or the object behind. So I'm going to hold down my shift key and click on that to get rid of it. And now I just have those five items and I can use my arrow keys to move them around. So now I'm going to do just selecting these by holding down shift and clicking copy paste. And you can notice I only copied two through five. And the reason there is because, again, I don't want to use this same formatting here because it's it's a group number formatting. So we'll put that in here. Change it to 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And then I'll just do the same thing again. And the same thing again. So these boxes are pretty close to being where they are. Um, 10, 11, oops, 12. Biggest thing I can say here is if you do end up doing this, uh, number your boxes as you do them because it's very easy to come in here and copy paste your boxes, and then go on to move some, go on to move and do something else, and then a week later you've printed the magic sheet and realized you have two identical uh, channel number sets there. Um, so that's that, and then I've got these little arrows here, so I'm going to grab. I'm going to spin that around so it's straight down, and I'm going to put a couple of arrows in there. And the reason that I use the arrow, oops, the reason I use the arrows is because, again, um, without having a lot of colors in this show, because everything changes color, it's great to be able to quickly look at the magic sheet, see a directional arrow, and kind of know where those lights are going. Um, so, yeah. So now in looking at this and looking how it's laid out versus what I have in real life, uh, if I come back over here, I can see in my plot that this top light is actually kind of over this like sand dune area, these upstage ones, where these are kind of downstage. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to space these out a bit more. So I'm going to grab these. I'm going to grab really all of them except for the bottom row. 
move those up by two arrow clicks. Grab these, move those up by two arrow clicks. Deselect these, move those up by two arrow clicks. So that's a little bit more of a, a layout. Um, there are plenty of tools in here to align. So if I select multiple things, and you look up here, uh, kind of like in, in the EOS Magic Sheet Creator or in Vectorworks, you know, there's a line center, there's a line, uh, there's distribute, there's a line, there's all those different tools you can use. Sometimes when I'm just doing these uh, these little things, it um, it just is easier to click and drag. Oh, thank you again for that tip. I'm, you've you've all have changed the way I use Vectorworks now because it's been a pet peeve of mine for a while. So I'm glad. And now I know I learned something today. Great. Um, so I just kind of got rid of some of the apron there again because I'm not using this apron. You can see where the edge of my stage is here. There's a show deck, so I'm going to get rid of that. Great. So that's my first system. Um, now that I have that, I'm going to move it up right there um, to move things around. Uh, if you move it like this, it's kind of free moving. If you hold down shift, just like in pretty much any standard you know, Adobe program or any program, really, if you hold down shift and move, then it will uh, constrain to a line or constrain to a, an axis. Um, so great, so I've got my top system done. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is my high side temps. So in here, in this plot, I've got, um, you see 21, 22, 23, I've got four rows of three units each. So there's three areas across by four rows, by four areas deep of a high side uh, luster two gobo breakout. So I'm gonna take <clears throat> the whole thing Marquee select over top of it, copy paste it. And for right now, I'm gonna put it here. So right now, in this part of the magic sheet process, I'm just kind of creating these objects. I start to really lay them out a little bit later. So, uh, you know, I, I, this column might end up being all of my top stuff or my stuff above my stage. This column over here might end up being all of my front stuff. I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, but for now, I just need to get the content in there. So to do this, uh, again, three areas across by four areas deep, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna delete these. I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna move them in. You can see as I start to move these in, I, I left a little gap in there. As I bring this closer, it's gonna give me a suggested, I just locked there. You can see kind of at the bottom, there's two little green things where it's giving me an even spacing, uh, which is nice. It helps me a little bit. And I'm gonna change these to 21. 22, 23, 24, 25, 6. This is one time where a, a tool like Vectorworks or a tool that you know is made to number things would be handy, but it doesn't really take that much time. So. Great, so there's my systems there. I'm going to change this to high side temps. And uh, hey, Luther. Um, this is going to be series two, two LED. And this also has R132 in it. And of course, it's GAM579, which if you're, any of my, my Instagram friends will know that I use GAM579 far too often, but it's great. Um, so I'm gonna take these arrows now and I'm just rotating them a bit. And the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to put that gobo uh, kind of in this blank space here. So um, to do that, I think I probably, knowing me, used that gobo in elf. I guess I probably deleted it from this magic sheet, didn't I? If I undo enough things, maybe it'll be there. Actually, it's a better idea. So I'm gonna grab this construction gobo and I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna paste that in here. Just gonna put it there. <clears throat> And now what I can do is if I open up um, Finder here, or if I open up Chrome or whatever, I search for GAM579, I can guarantee you I will find one very quickly in my, um, my computer. So there's one, there's 579, there's 579. So I'm gonna use that. I'm actually gonna take this in Finder and I'm gonna drag it right on top of that frame. And it's going to replace the contents of that frame with my new image. So that's a big thing. So if I needed to change a gobo really quickly, um, it's it's really easy to do. If I had multiple frames selected and I did that, it would do the same thing. So I've got that there now. I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna paste it right there and kind of align it there. Not quite aligned. Uh, and you can kind of notice if I zoom in on here a little bit more that there's also some transparency involved with that gobo. Um, to do that, you just click on it, 
And then right here next to all of your, you know, your stroke options, your color options, there's a transparency fader, just like there would be in any other uh, program. So great. So zooming out. So that system is done. So now I know I have two of that same system. I have another one coming from the other direction uh, that starts with channel 41. So I'm just going to take that whole box and I'm going to copy paste it and I'm going to put it right next to it. Now this is where I start to figure out exactly how I'm going to lay the drawing out. Because if I had this one here, the ones coming from stage right to stage left here, and I put the other ones below it, that doesn't make a lot of sense with how they're laid out in real life. So instead, I'm going to lay them out a little more true to life, where this side over here is going to be going this way, and the other side will be going the other way. Now the cool part about this is since I use very similar numbering schemes in all of my channel numbering, I don't have to actually edit every single one of these numbers. I can come in here and just change the first number of each thing, 44, 45, 46, change the first number of each thing and it will, let's see, now that's where it gets, that's where you get lost right there because you, you get in the habit of typing one number and then you forget that you're changing numbers. So, great, so that is done. So now that I've seen this, I think I'm gonna move these up and put them next to my top lights here. So now across the top bar of my magic sheet, I have uh, top LEDs, my high sides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, great, so that's three systems already. Let's go back to the plot here for a second. Um, if I go to my booms and ladders plot, um, I can see I have, a, I have ladder systems in here as well, and these have kind of a, just a color, they have both a, a par color fill, there's a warm from one side to cool from another, as well as a luster two LED fill, as well as a low color source par fill. So I'm starting to think about this magic sheet in the ways that I'm gonna be using these systems of light. So often when I'm, when I'm working, I'm gonna be working on, uh, I usually will start with my background or my psych and then I work out from there. So usually I do the psych first and then I'll work from my tops and my sides and stuff like that before I ever get to fronts. So I'm going to lay these out on this page in a way that will make sense of how I'm going to look at the page when I'm in tech, if that makes any sense at all. Um, I hope it does because I didn't even follow what I just said. Anyway, uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out my ladders. So I'm going to go back to this real quick, my Vectorworks drawing. I see that in these ladders, uh, I've got these house ladders here too that have some of the same systems on them. So I've got one, two, three, four rows by three deep again, starting with channel 61. So that's great, because that means that all I need to do is come in here, copy paste the same box again. Take these, copy paste. Put it here. I'm gonna change this to ladder. I'm just gonna call it color fill. This is series two LED. No gobo, but it will have 132. And I forgot what channel that was, 61. And of course there's no gobo, so I'm gonna get rid of the gobos. I'm gonna do 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, Again, if ah, I did it again, there we go. If anything I say doesn't make sense, or if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, I'm amazed that there's like there's 20 people watching this right now. It's uh, one of the most boring things I can think of, but uh, great. Anyway, um, so if we go back to the plot for a second, we can see that uh, I've got these three ladders, but then out here in the house, this is downstage my plaster line or kind of out in my proscenium. So these aren't really going to be side light like they were, uh, like they would, um, they would be on the ladders. Because again, with that show deck that we have, they're not, the people aren't going to be uh, crossing down into there very often. So it's almost going to kind of be almost like a box booby slot, proscenium slot kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to note that on this magic sheet here a little bit. Um, and how I do that is, let's see, how am I going to do that? Well, if I look at where these lights are hitting, I obviously don't have any ladders up here in this far upstage area because it's got these like side mirror things here. If I come back to the plot here, um, and let me see, this is, I don't know where this plate is. I didn't draft this. Again, if you're just joining, uh, uh, one of my associates, Jessica Krager, uh, drafted this. If you need somebody to do drafting for you, please hire her. She's excellent. Um, 
Okay, well, I don't know where that plate is, but anyway, uh, there's no light coming in from the ladders upstage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that thing I was talking about before with uh, the frames and the objects, and I'm actually going to move this object inside of its frame up a little bit. So now I have, um, I've got these three systems of light are kind of more true to where they are in real life, and I'm going to grab these three and I'm going to move them down and separate them a little bit below that that plaster line. So again, this is something simple and it might not be obvious to somebody walking or sitting down and looking at this magic sheet for the first time, but the nice part about the magic sheet is it really is, is very personal to you. So it should be something that works for you and works for the way that you work. Um, yeah, oh, there's some questions here. Great. Oh, hey, Jake. Um, well, good. I'm glad that it's, uh, glad it's useful for some people. Um, Harrison, have you found that indicating cross directions for high side units in addition to arrows with O oh, is not useful? Um, what do you mean? Do you mean like in the text putting carrots there? I'm not quite sure what you mean. So in my paperwork, I do carrots and things like that. Um, but on the magic sheet, I usually only use the arrows. So if, maybe I'm not understanding your question, but anyway. Um, so great, so I have that. Now that I've created that again, I'm gonna copy paste it. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I've done it before, uh, and in looking at this now, I actually, oh, Jesus, sorry, my scroll wheel here is not cooperating. Uh, I'm not super happy with the size of these arrows, so just, I'm not going to do it right now because it'll be boring to watch, but I'll probably end up actually putting these arrows kind of oops, up into the, the areas here by the text, which I do a lot, um, or I might put more of them. Um, uh, but I guess, you know, I, I, it could go either way. I, I don't typically do that, but I guess you, you could, there's nothing stopping you from that. Okay, so in this other system here, uh, these channels start with 81, so again, I'm just gonna do 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Luther, I, I will put more. <laughs> I'll probably make them bigger too. I think if we, if we go back to this elf magic sheet, you can see like these arrows were a lot bigger and there were a lot more arrows there. Um, so once I get all this stuff in there, I'll probably go back and, and add a lot more things. Okay. So right there, now, and, you know, this has taken a long time because I've been explaining everything, but you can see this goes pretty quickly once you have one built. Uh, it's a lot of just copy-pasting and, and, and just changing data around. Um, I will say I do have in front of me, I did kind of a, a, a notebook version first, and it's not really laid out like I'll lay out the magic sheet, but I like to write out each system first. Um, a lot of people will ask too, like, why do you spend a lot of time doing this? Why do you, you know, um, why, why do you have an associate or assistant do this? I, I like to do the magic sheet myself because I really get familiar with where my lights are and what they're doing. Um, this plot, for instance, uh, like I said, Jessica drafted this. Um, I gave notes and stuff, but I didn't really spend a lot of time studying exactly where everything is and all of that. So this really gives me a chance, usually a couple of days before I go into focus or go into tech, to really get familiar with the rig again um, and, and be prepared. Um, I think part of that too is uh, a lot of times when I'm turning in plots, even if I am drafting them myself, I'll turn in that plot sometimes a month, a month and a half before focus, and I'll have several other shows between the time I turned in a plot and the time I actually get on site to do the show. So I might not remember what I was planning or what I did when I first did the paperwork. So this gives me a chance to kind of re-examine that and get my head back into the, uh, the ball game again. Great. So I have now have my ladder LEDs, I've got my high side temps, I've got my top LEDs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do my front lights next. So I'm going to grab the same box here, copy paste this. Now I'm just going to drop it there, zoom in. Uh, so this is a, uh, again, South Pacific, so it's a big musical. Um, and most of my rig changes color, so I don't have a whole lot of front stuff. Most of my light is coming from the ladders, coming from the box booms. Most of my front light will be coming from follow spots. So uh, in in my plot here, um, go back to the front of house plot. The front of house hang on this show is very light, no pun intended. Um, there's you know a series of there there would be ten of these source four LED tungstens. The reason there's not one in the center spot is because they the theater hung a center cluster, um, and so we can't make that shot. But so there's only nine. But anyway. Uh, 
uh, yeah, Eleuther, to answer your question, yeah, so it's not referenced, unfortunately, um, but it is, I, I do just have an image um, in the background. But actually, you actually have a really good point, and what I could do to make it a referenced image is I could, I could save that screenshot that I took of my Vectorworks drawing in the beginning, I could save that as an image file, and then it would be a referenced image within, uh, within InDesign. There's not a way that I know of to actually like reference a viewport viewport from Vectorworks into InDesign. So I guess that is one pro in the in the column of making magic sheets in in Vectorworks. Um, but again, I think the other pros of outweigh. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a, a oh, that's interesting. So you make it referenced in Photoshop from from. I'll have to talk to you about that later. I'd like to know how to do that because that would be that would be very handy. To be able to do that, of course, by this time, um, by this time when I'm making these magic sheets, typically that background is not going to change um, in most of the projects that I'm working on. But I could obviously, I could definitely see how that could be useful. Oh no, you're not distracting. Sorry. I hope that the text from the chat shows up on the video after the fact, so people aren't confused as to what I'm uh, what I'm saying. Anyway, um, so front light here. I've got these are a series. Oops. Series 2 LED tungsten HDs, and they are Lee 201. Um, so I use kind of a, a very no color blue, it's a full blue, not a no color blue, um, for that front light. And here, okay, here's a new thing. So now on all of these boxes so far, I've had a gray background, a gray fill. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose this box, and up here in my color objects, um, I can I can change that color. So you see right now I only have the basic uh, CMY, uh, RGB, and then of course I have my black and my gray that I've made um, as well. I can create all kinds of swatches and I can name them whatever I want. Um, and if I was doing this from a previously made drawing, I have a lot of uh, a lot of those colors already built. Um, but to make this lead to a one, I'm going to start with a color that's pretty close to it. So I'm going to choose my primary blue. And then right here by the trash can, there's a button that says new swatch. The reason I chose that blue first is because when I hit new swatch, it carries those CMYK values into that new swatch automatically. And if I double click on it, I can <clears throat> come in here and I can change these sliders around. And again, this isn't a perfectly scientific process at all. I'm just getting it to look kind of similar to what lead to a one looks like. So I'm doing that, and then I can name it to, I could just name it L201, and now that swatch is up here in my color library and I have it. So if I was going to do L202, I would do the same thing. I would take my 201, I'd make a new swatch, bring that cyan back just a little bit, and it would show up as a, as a lighter color swatch. So pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to spin my arrows around here. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And again, I'm holding down shift when I do that because it allows me to get a... Uh, Kind of like polar snapping in in Vectorworks, um, I'm able to snap to uh, different axes. Um, and then I'm going to look and see at my sheet here. So I have three rows of front light. So I'm going to delete this upstage row. And they start with channel 101, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 6, 7. Now this center center here is is missing again because we have a center cluster that gets blocked and it's really not that big of a deal if this was a, a play or in a smaller space i would obviously try to fill in that space but we honestly have so much light there that it i just don't miss it it doesn't really matter um, one thing i will say and this is something that i probably should have done and i might do is for the sake of simplicity, or for the sake of uniformity, I guess I should say, is typically I would skip number 108 here and then go 109 and 110. The reason for that is because if you look at how I lay out my channel numbers, you can see that you know this downstage left corner ends in a 5. So channel 5 is here. I, mean, I guess that's it doesn't really hold true for this because there's only 3, but when I have 5 lights... Sorry. When I have 5 lights across... Um, I want to know that when I say, you know, 10 and 110 that I'm hitting the same area. Right now, if I say 10 and 110, I'd be hitting mid-stage left and upstage right. Or, uh, yeah, no. Yes, that's right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and change that, actually. And so, Jess, if you're watching, that'll be a note that we want to fix <laughs> in the paperwork. Um, so I'm going to change that now. 
And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll change things in the magic sheet and then just make a list and then go back and change them after the fact. So there. If it was a, you know, I might put an X there or something, but because I'm the one using this, I'm going to remember what that means. And that'll be fine. So great. So I've got my front light. I'm going to save real quick. Just do a command S, which I just did, but uh, save often. I very rarely have had InDesign crash on me, but it has happened. Um, it does back up your work as you go to a certain extent, um, but, you know, just make backups of everything you do. That's always a good rule of thumb. Okay, I've got my front light in there. Uh, the other thing I have in this show that I'm going to probably want to put up towards the top of my magic sheet is I've got a row of uh, these Elation Chorus Line 16s. We wanted the GLP impression bars, but couldn't afford them. So we've got a row of, of 12 of these. Uh, they're the, the tilting strip lights, essentially. So there's uh, there's like portals in this show and everything. So my idea, a lot of the design concept of this is going to be really low backlight. And these can tilt and zoom. Uh, so these are going to be used a lot in the show. And because they're going to be used a lot in the show, I want them kind of prominently displayed on my magic sheet. Um, and these are channels 381 through 392. So I'm going to come in really quickly, and I'm going to drop those. Well, I don't know where I'm going to drop those yet. I'm going to copy-paste just the top part of this box. And I'm going to do back strips. line 16s. Now it becomes a little complicated because I have uh, 12 units that I need to fit in the same space as these five units. So this is going to be one of the times where I might be willing to change text size a little bit. But before I do that, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to actually put the numbers in all the way across and see how it looks. Um, a lot of this is, you know, I, I used to try to plan the whole magic sheet out before I made it. And that just, it just doesn't work. Um, you always want to change things once you get in there. Still 16 people watching, great. Um, okay, so 382. See, so as you can see, this is getting really big and it's not, uh, not really great. So I've got two more of these lights to actually add in here. So what I might do, come on, 390 and 391. You notice that I saved that italicized box again for the end, and I uh, placed it in there so that I have my subgroup. And again, this is an example of when the group and the subgroup are exactly the same. So what I'll probably do is this subgroup will be recorded in reverse order so that when we're doing quick selections and stuff like that, uh, it works out. I actually think what I might do for this is leave them wide, and I'll make this a double width uh, group on my on my magic sheet. So I'm just going to go like this. That might look bad, um, but we'll see. And again, I'm going to redo these arrows when everybody's not watching me. And in this case, I'm not even going to put the, the view of my stage in there, because it's kind of pointless. Um, I don't really need it there um, for this. So I don't know where I'm going to put this yet. So for right now, I'm just going to put it off to the side. I know I have the object, and I can put it. Um... Oh, thank you, Ben. I have two 110. See, this is, again, why why keeping track of how you number things is important. Great, so 111. Uh, so anyway, so I'm going to put this uh, I'm going to put this out over here. The cool part about this kind of like with, um... well, I can't think of a program now, but I can actually draw, I was thinking of FileMaker. I can drag things off the layout, too, and obviously they won't print there. Um, you can put them wherever you want. Um, great. So let's work on the box booms now. <clears throat> so the box booms are another interesting system in this particular show because I have, uh, I don't have a lot of them. I've got, I think, four systems of box boom. I've kind of got these low, um, I saw Harrison talking about this position today in the Discord channel and how much he loved it. This kind of like low front diagonal box boom position. This is like, you know, almost head on. So I've got some luster twos there. Uh, above there I have some tungsten uh, luster, some tungsten studio, studio tungsten, whatever they're called from ETC. And then I also have, for some reason, this venue has a bunch of uh, uh, ovation fixtures too. They have all of this ETC stuff and then they have like 10 ovations, which I, I don't get, but they work. So I've got those out there too. 
Um, there's almost no incandescent fixtures in this show. I think this Congo fill out here I have on the balcony rail, these tens are almost the only, these, and, yeah, those and then the pars and the ladders are the only incandescent lights in the whole show, which is kind of cool. Um, so anyway, so because of that, I don't really need to devote an entire box of space to those, uh, those systems of, of light. Um, if I pull up my uh, cheat sheet again here, you can see how these are channeled. This is another situation where I'm actually going to re-channel these a bit, because originally when we drafted them, they were going to be the same color. So like 131 through 136 were all going to be warm, 141 through 146 were all going to be cool, and I ended up splitting them by side. So I'm going to actually re-channel these to be 131 through 133, and then 140s, 150s, 160s. Um, and so let's do that real quick. I'm actually going to come into Elf real quick and see how I did it before. So you can see for Elf, this is how I did it. And I'm honestly just going to grab this whole thing. And I'm going to copy that. And I am going to paste it into the South Pacific Magic Sheet and just change my numbers. So again, you're not really missing much here. Um, I, I'm doing all the same things I've done before, so I'm not really skipping over anything. You can see now, too, that my color swatches have come in with that with that selection. So I didn't name them in that. I think I did, if I remember correctly, I did that elf magic sheet like at a Delta Sky Club on my laptop, so I did it really quickly. Um, but uh, you, you get the idea. So in my box booms, I've got luster LEDs. Um, oh, and these are three across, so I'm going to just delete the ones that are two across. No reason to reinvent the wheel here. And I'm going to copy paste you. Put you here. I've got four systems of three across total. Oh, okay, I see. I need to actually delete this too. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, I'll do this a better way. There we go. Now we're starting to lose some viewers. I'm starting to get bored. <laughs> um, okay. Um, great. So now I've got these. Again, these aren't the real numbers. Oops, I did the wrong. Spin these guys around real quick. Boom, boom. And boom, boom. So I've got... Uh, I've got four systems that do this. So I'm going to have four boxes like this. And then I shouldn't have deleted all of those. My, my LEDs do both. So I'm going to come in here, grab this one more time. Delete you. Great. So now I've got placeholders in here for all of this. I obviously need to change my colors. I need to change my numbers. But I can do that really quickly now that I have those in there. So box booms. Uh, first one, I've got R05 that's coming in from house left. And those are 131, 132, 133. Now again, this is another situation where I have, you know, a group 131 will be these three lights, so will group 133. It is a bit redundant, but it allows me to quickly grab things if I need them. If I, if I just, if, for instance, if I was just grabbing group 105 at my front light, and then I need to grab a box boom, my eyes might already be on the left side, and I, it just saves a little bit of time uh, when I'm doing it. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to make an RO5 swatch. Oops. And RO5 has a little more pink in it, so I'll go a little more magenta with it. From this side, then, I have Lee 137, which is one of my favorite lavenders. Um, I don't really have a lavender swatch here, so I'm going to choose this kind of pink that I made, and I'm going to duplicate it, and then I'm going to come in here and kind of give it a little more cyan. That's eh, pretty good. And this is going to be 141, 142, 143. Ooh, the numbers of watchers are going back up. A lot of questions for you people. Um, okay. Sorry, I shouldn't insult the people who are taking time out of their day to watch this, I guess. I apologize. Um, next is going to be RO8, which is coming... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a dummy. Um, this is actually... Yeah, I messed up. Okay, I should look at my notes before I do this. This is Lee 137 here. So I'm not going to spend time and like move the whole thing. I'm just going to swap these two boxes. Or I'm not going to change colors. I'm just going to swap these two boxes around. 
Great. And this is, uh, actually this is Lee 202, look at that. And those are the right numbers for it, <laughs> great. Lee 137 then is in the 150s. And so those of you who have had questions about my channeling, you kind of see how this is laid out now. So I know that in all of my box boom systems, no matter what color it is, no matter what angle it's coming from, that the start of that system, the, end, the, the one that's ending in one is gonna be downstage right. Um, that's backwards from a lot of ways people do it. I think, you know, the, the New York way is to do it from downstage left because your unit numbers are labeled from stage left. Um, I, I do it the other way. I obviously I do my unit numbers from stage left, but I have just always done my channels from left to right because that's how I read. Um, and it's always made more sense to me. Um, so people have been mad at me for that before, but I think there's more important things to be mad about. So anyway, so R08 is my last one here, and that's a little bit more pale than this, so I'm just gonna make a new one. And go a little yellower. That's pretty close to R08. And that's gonna be in the 160s. So Jess, again, if you're watching, that's gonna be another channel change. Sorry about that. And then finally down here, I'm gonna switch this. This is my luster box boom lows. I'm gonna change that back to this. Uh, luster plus R132, great. And channels on those are 121. So I start here, 121, 123. Now in this one, since it is the same, since it is the same kind of color, I mean, it's gonna be the same system, I do let my numbering wrap. So I do do 123 and then start here with 124 again. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I haven't really given that a lot of thought. I guess it would, it could make sense to do it from the other way because a lot of times those are gonna be in separate colors anyway. But again, you know, it, it works either way. There's not a right or wrong to this, which is I think my favorite part of it. Part of it. <clears throat> um, and I can grab those easily because again, group 126 is gonna be this, you know, house right set. Group 123 is gonna be my house left set. Great. So now my box boom is done. Um, whoops, I don't need to send myself an email. That's right, you can't see this screen, there we go. So I've got my box boom is done, I've rechanneled things. And I'm gonna go back on my cheat sheet here a little bit and see if there's anything that I have forgotten so far, because it's one of the easy things to do is forget a whole system, especially when you're kind of going out of order like this. Um, typically, I would print this uh, cheat sheet and I'd have a highlighter or just a pen and I would cross off channels as I did it, um, but I did not do that in this case. Great, so I have all of the first couple pages and so now I'm on to these color source par fills. Okay, so that's channels 201 through 212. And what these color source par fills are doing, let's go back to the plot here for a second. Those are gonna be in my overhead, no, sorry, those are in my ladder plot. Actually a section might be better at looking at this. So if we look at the section here, um, if Vectorworks wants to let me look at the section here. Oh gosh, okay, here it is. Um, you can see, what is going on with this? You can see on my ladders, I've got two low color source pars that'll kind of, one will be shooting near, one will be shooting far. And I only have three deep. Uh, these ones that are here on the, the front ladder system, those are gonna be kind of, again, what Harrison was talking about in the Discord channel a little while ago. Uh, these are gonna be kind of more of a, um, kind of like a, a front diagonal boxy kind of punch thing. They're very close to being the same angle as these lusters. They're just a little closer to the stage. So I've got two areas across by three areas deep for this. And I'm gonna first gonna look in here and see if I've done anything similar to that. And I haven't, but the closest thing I have is gonna be probably one of these guys. So I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna copy paste it again. And I'll line it up. I'm gonna say, I don't know, what am I gonna call these? Uh, low CS pars, I'll probably come up with a better name later, but that's fine for now. Uh, what am I doing? For some reason I can't type, so I'm just gonna copy paste. <laughs> um, actually I'm gonna call these ladder low pars. Now this is a, a Example two of where I'm gonna need, so actually I'm not gonna talk about that, I'll talk about that when I get to the booms. Uh, so right now I'm gonna delete these. I'm also gonna delete the center row, because again, I only have two sets. I'm gonna move this set a little closer to center. 
I'm going to move this set a little closer to center, like so. Um, and then my numbers were 201, 2, 3, 2, 5. And again, I only have three rows, so I'm actually just going to delete this and this. So this is where we have that conversation with the director after the first designer run, and we say, hey, remember how we talked about people not coming all the way downstage? And they say, yeah, but I need them there. And I say, oh, okay. And that's the compromise. Anyway, um, now I've got this. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to flip my arrows around. And one thing now that I'm, again, now that I'm laying this out a little bit, and I've got these systems that are kind of side by side, um, Oh, that's interesting. I should have renumbered that. Oh, that's fine. So I'll finish that thought in one second. 210, 211, 212. Now that I've got these systems that are side by side, what I might end up doing is getting rid of one of these titles and kind of stretching this out across the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to do that yet, though. I'm going to wait until I have everything, and then I'm going to print it out. I'm going to look at it and see how it feels. And if it if it feels too busy and it feels like I have too much text, then I'll start getting rid of objects. So I think you know the, the ladder color fills, the high side temps, those could all be kind of big headers with smaller boxes underneath them. But we'll we'll see how that goes. Okay. Uh, so I've got my 201s done. Those are all done. Next up, I have my. Uh, my pars that are on the ladder that are going to be my warm and my cool fills. You can see back to the section here, I've got just three regular incandescent source four pars on there that will make up uh, those fills. And I did not, I, I wanted to do another set of these downstage, but we just did not have enough of them, which was frustrating. So now this uh, is the same, same distribution as these ladder color fills minus the downstage areas. So I'm going to just copy paste this box. I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to say this is ladder, cool, actually which side comes from what? Uh, actually warm comes from this side for So if you kind of notice, well I guess you don't notice because I only have LEDs in the show, but a lot of times I'll, I'll keep the similar thing. So if I have a cool and a warm system, I'll keep the, the symmetry of those the same on the magic sheet. So I might always have the cools on the right, warms on the left, or vice versa. But there's nothing worse than having like, you know, having front cool, front warm, and then right underneath it is, is top warm, top cool. It just doesn't make sense graphically to lay it out that way. So again, I only have three of these. Oops. So I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna move these up back to where they go. Oops, I'm just going to do that and deselect you. Now one interesting thing about this, um, I'm actually going to put these in line with the other ones I have and then move them back towards center, is I'm not using this apron area here, so I might choose to bring in this frame a little bit. And if you're if you're just joining now and you missed the part about frames, uh, go back again and watch towards the beginning of this where I talk about frames versus objects. I might decide to crop this off, but I'm going to wait on that until I get more information on the sheet. Because a lot of times what I find is I get towards the end and I run out of space for something. And so then I can start kind of shifting some of the white space around and getting rid of it. And especially, like, I don't need this whole upstage sand dune area in this. I could save a good, you know, quarter inch all the way across this whole system if I got rid of that. But I'm not going to worry about it for now. Um, so my ladder colors here, this is RO9. Source for par, RO9. I'm going to grab that box again, and I already had an RO8 swatch that I made that I didn't label, so I'm going to duplicate that, and I'm going to make it a little yellower. It's a little paler. Call that, oh, that's a little too gold. I'm going to make that my RO9. Well, close enough. Of course, that all depends on you know the color that the printer and, and everything else so I don't I don't make it too perfect it just needs to be enough where I can draw my eye really quickly to the to the cha the channels this is 221 oh oh that's right because I deleted something 220 
So I've got nine warm ladder pars, and I'm going to do the same thing again for my cool ladder pars, which are one of my favorite blues, Lee 161. Great. Um, come in here, and I don't have anything kind of close. I guess the closest thing I have is Lee 201, so I'm going to click that, duplicate it, and go a little bit more saturated with it. Yeah, it's a little tealer than it would be in real life, but that's fine. The other thing that uh, to, to note when you're doing this, don't forget to go back and change your headers. Like, I almost forgot to change this to ladder warm. I've done whole shows where it's literally been the final preview, and I look at the magic sheet and realize the whole time that I had the same header duplicated twice, and it just... It's just frustrating more than anything, I guess. Uh, now again, since I'm only changing one digit, I'm just gonna click in here and do this, this, this. And again, if there's any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, 239, great. So that system is done. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and you can see we've come pretty far already. We've been going for a little over an hour now, but if I was doing this without explaining it, this would only take probably about I can knock one of these out in 20 to 30 minutes, again, because I have all this stuff built and I'm able to just copy paste a lot. And now that I've zoomed out, I can see I do have a lot of white space kind of in this, this middle row here. So chances are when I get a little further along, I'm gonna get rid of some of them. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it. Okay, so let's go back to our cheat sheet here for a second. Zoom out. So now you can see I've got all my box boom stuff in. I've got my LEDs in there. My R09, my Lee 161. Okay, so now I'm on to the booms. So this is actually another uh, way of laying things out when I do the booms. So, uh, let me see here, did you do over there, color pussy? Yes, you can. You can overlay a color, you can do all that kind of stuff uh, to, to whatever you want. Um, that, that's, that's one of the reasons I like using this so much is because since it's designed for graphic layout, it really, I mean, you know, this is used to lay out magazines and newspapers and things like that. So there are tons of graphics options. Um, a lot of stuff that, you know, doing it in Vectorworks, you just have to kind of make do versus this where it's designed to make this kind of a, a thing. So yes, Luther, to answer your question, yeah. And yeah, you're right, the background is a little bit dark. What I probably will do for that rather than doing an overlay is I just come in here and I would take the opacity down on it a bit. And it's funny you mentioned that I was thinking that too. Um, so yeah, I'll probably I'll probably go through and do that once it's all said and done because there is a lot of gray and there's a lot of lines in that background image and it's a little distracting. Like the the number one thing I want on this magic sheet is to be able to see my channel numbers. Um, and if I if I've got other lines interfering with those channel numbers, it becomes a problem. And that's another again one of the other reasons if I zoom in really close here that I put a white stroke around the text so that if there is a line or something behind it that it doesn't look like it's part of the of the of the box or of the number. Great. Okay, so the next thing I have is my booms. So all of the systems other than the box booms I've done so far, I've done a separate box with a stage, a top-down stage view for every single system that I've had, or for every single angle that I've had. So like high side temps coming from this side have had their own box, high side temps coming from this side have had their own box. It's wasteful to me to do the same thing with the booms. So what I do with the booms is I actually draw, I drew a single box and I drew the entire boom system on there with, instead of where it's focused to, I put where the light is. And again, like that might be confusing if you're sitting down and looking at the magic sheet for the first time, um, but I just, I don't know, I find that it works pretty well and I think that most people do their booms on a magic sheet in a similar way. Um, so in this case, I'm just gonna move these arrows out of the way for right now. And I've got uh, boom heads. And these are actually uh, series two LED Fresnels. Um, I had eight Fresnels, I needed a place to use them, so that's where they're going. Uh, and these channels start with 241. Two. And this is actually something interesting too in the way I number things with my booms. So you notice my booms kind of go upstage to downstage, or, or downstage to upstage instead of right left. And again, this is just totally a personal preference thing. Um, there's not a, a right or wrong way to do this. And if somebody tells you that there is, they're lying to you. Um, and because I, again, have these italicized numbers, 
I'm able to grab wings really quickly this way. I spent some time learning MA this week, and so saying wings has a different meaning to me now, which was really fun. I'm uh, trying to get more into corporate and other kind of work a little bit this season, because um, I've been pretty much doing exclusively theater for a while. And so I'm trying to brush up on my M MA skills a bit after basically being exclusively EOS for the past, like, several, I don't know, like six or seven years. Um, anyway. Hey, Trey. <laughs> um, okay, so that's, so this is my, my booms. So this I might do a little bit more aggressive uh, uh, arrows on. I might do one for each thingy here. And there also is, if I click and hold down option and drag, oh, no, maybe not. I thought I could. Oh. I swear, oh, there we go. If I hold down option and I drag, kind of like in Vectorworks, uh, you can uh, duplicate without having to use copy paste like that. Um, so I'm gonna command C, command V, like this. And so hopefully you kind of get an idea of, of how I lay those booms out. And again, like, this is not where they're focused. This is where they're coming from. Um, but it just makes sense to me. And this actually, I think, for, uh, Luther had a point a little while ago about how many, you know, you, it gets kind of distracting because there's a lot of objects in this ground plan. So if I, I'm going to go ahead and grab this ground plan. I'm going to bring the opacity back a bit. And now it's a little easier to read uh, in this case. So that's that boom. And now I also have shins. These booms are actually relatively simple because we have a lot of moving scenery in this show. Um, so if I go back here, you can see there's only two instruments on each boom. Um, so I'm just going to do this. And those start with the 50s. So let's do 51. Okay. And that's it. I mean, i got to change these to Series 2 LED. Uh, this is R132. So the booms are done. So right there, that was really quick and really easy. Uh, and this is another situation where I have extra white space because I don't have any booms up here in this sand dune area, which is kind of a bummer because there's going to be some cool stuff happening up there. Um, but they've got these like side mirrors, so I couldn't put a boom there. So when I start actually going to PDA, actually, I'm going to do it right now. I'm just going to get rid of, oops, I'm going to get rid of that space because I don't need it. And really, in this particular case, I don't even really need the background image of the of this set behind these booms. Um, but I did it, so it's going to stay. Great. So zooming out again. And you can start to see I'm starting to run out of space pretty quickly here, and so I have to make a decision on if I'm going to uh, how I'm going to how I'm going to approach that. I'm. <sighs> I'm probably going to end up putting moving lights on a secondary magic sheet for this because I don't know that I'm going to be able to fit them all. We have, I think, close to 50 moving lights in this show. Um, I don't think they're going to fit on here, are they? Um, anyway, oh, I saw this backstrip thing here too that i got to figure out. Maybe I'll put those... Maybe I'll move these guys down a bit. Actually, and I should point this out at the same time. Right now, I'm clicking and dragging everything. I'm, I'm highlighting everything. You can just, like in any of the program, do a command or control G and group things. I typically don't group things until I'm almost done. And I guess the only real reason for that is because it's just a pain to have to ungroup and regroup and manipulate groups and stuff like that. Um, actually, I'm going to keep leaving those out for right now. I don't know where I'm going to put those yet. All right there. Okay. So typically when I go to finalize this, I'll make each thing its own group so that then I can click and drag and move them around the way I want them to move around. Um, and then I'll also, sometimes I'll put a little black border around each thing. It really just depends on how it looks. Oh, and actually, actually that's a, a good thing to bring up right now. So right now, as I'm looking at this layout, you can see that all of my frames have a little box around them, which is great for when I'm laying things out because it allows me to see my spacing. It allows me to align things really quickly and easily. But if I want to see what this is going to look like, that's not super helpful. So I have a, again, I have a little stream deck that I have for this. So I've got all these hotkeys mapped to it but I'm going to use just the menu commands for now. If I come in here and go to Window, um, I can go to, oh, I'm sorry, to View. I'm going to go here to Extras, and you can see there's a thing here that says Hide Frame Edges, and that's on a Mac, uh, Control Command H. If I click that now, I've just got my text and my images, and it's not quite as messy and as crowded as it used to look. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and change all of these opac opacities really quickly, because... Ever since Luther pointed it out, I can't unsee it now. So I'm going to make them all 50. 
Great. That's good enough for now. Um, so yeah, so I can do that. So when I'm editing, I like to have my frame edges turned on. When I'm going to see how it looks, I like to turn my frame edges back off again. So I'm going to go to View, uh, Extras, Show Frame Edges. Now there's all kinds of other things in here. You can turn rulers on and off. You can set overall display performance. So again, when I showed you earlier how the, the graphics were kind of fuzzy, InDesign will do that automatically in order to preserve system resources. Um, I can do that on a, on a global level here, or I can do it box by box by right clicking on the box. Um, I can also turn on grids, I can turn on guides, I can turn on all kinds of, of little things like smart, the smart guides that kind of show up as I drag things around. That's all done here in this view menu. Um, I typically, like I said, I've had those all mapped to a stream deck, so it's right by my, my mouse. I can quickly just hit the buttons um, quickly and efficiently. Okay, let's get back to it. I will tell you, I am going to go, oh, you know, I just noticed a mistake. So these front lights here, this upstage row, is actually farther upstage than that. And this row is midstage. So I'm going to do that and kind of space them out evenly. And you know what, I think I'm going to go ahead and get rid of, because we don't have any useful information in this upstage space on these four boxes of the ladders, I'm just going to come in here and I am going to, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click and I'm going to drag and I'm going to select all of my arrows. I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to deselect all of my background images. So now you can see I've got a bounding box around all my arrows and I can just move all those arrows down. Now I'm going to click my boxes, my frames, and I'm going to make them smaller like that. I'm going to make the bottoms a little smaller and I'm going to click and drag again the whole thing and I'm going to move them up so that they touch. Now I just made myself a lot more white space on my drawing. And this is another example of why I don't group things yet, because uh, that would have took, taken a lot longer to do if everything would have already been grouped. Um, I just like to wait until I'm in a, in a better place before I group everything. Okay, so right there, I just freed up a lot of space. So let's go back to the plot. Actually, let's go back to the cheat sheet for a second. So I just did my, um, I did my shins. I've got the psych here. I'm not going to do that quite yet. Let's do these next. So I've got, I talked a little bit earlier about this kind of like low LED cross box boom type light um, that's coming here, channels 281 through 286. So let's go ahead and drop those in and I'll show you on the plot where those are. Um, those are these three right here. So it's out here on these house ladders. They're kind of this, it's a really cool angle. Um, if you never tried it, I recommend it. But it's those three. Um, and again, I've got three coming from either side. So this is kind of, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this in my box boom system and I'm just going to denote it in a different way because I can use this exact same uh, box that I've already made here. I'm just going to say CS par low box. And again, my channel numbers on those are two, no, what are they? 281 through 286. So that's done, that system is in. Um, I also have uh, two little shin kickers here that'll be sitting on the deck, 291, 292 that are at series two LEDs as well. Um, oh, oh, I noticed a mistake, look at this. So this is a good example again of, of checking up on your work. If you look here, I have boom heads, I never change this to shins, so I'm gonna change this to shins. Um, and I'm not 100% sure where I'm going to put those shins yet. I'm honestly thinking about just putting them, or sorry, the shin kickers. I'm thinking about just putting them in the same box as the shins over here, rather than them taking up their own space on the magic sheet. But I'm going to save that for now. So I'm just going to actually write that on a sticky note so I don't forget it. Um, I will still forget it, but I'm going to say that I won't. Um, okay, so back to the cheat sheet here. So I've got my psych. I'm going to wait on that for a second. Basically, I'm looking for any systems that are they're going to be lighting people first. I always want to put my people lighting systems in first. Um, and I think the only other thing I have that's a people lighting system would be my, let's see, we cut the footlights because we don't have enough instruments. Um, I've got my indigo fill here. So I've got, I use Lee 71 as my Congo fill. I like it a lot more than Lee 181. I think Lee 181 is a little too red. Um, Lee 71 is a little more, it's just a little more blue to me. Um, and I just, I love it. So in this, I have a, a, my balcony fill, and I also did some kind of on a box boom par fill. Um, 
as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and drop those in real quick. And one thing you'll notice, let me go back to the plot here. Oops. Let me do that on a design layer. If I go out here, uh, these are, uh, you know, 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven, these are twofered. Um, the reason for that is this, this venue, the Sandy Springs Performing Arts Center down in Atlanta, was designed essentially to be an LED venue. Um, there's only, I believe, one or two sensor racks in there. They're all through power modules. Um, and there's not a lot of circuits at the front of house positions. Overhead, there's all kinds of Soka and other stuff and drop boxes and things. Um, but I, I want to say, and I don't know, Matt, the production electrician, if you're watching, you can correct me here. Um, I think there's only six circuits in the box booms around the entire space. So it's like they're mirrored. So, you know, it's like one, two, three, one, two, three, uh, and then four, five, six, four, five, six. So there's not a lot of circuits out there. Uh, the balcony rail, I think, has four or five um, or maybe only four. And we've already got, we've got two elation movers out there. They were supposed to be solo theaters, but that's a, that's a long story. Um, so those are going to be two circuits right there. Then I've got a circuit for LEDs. And then I, I would run out of circuits really quickly on the balcony rail, which seems dumb because you would think a balcony rail would have, you know, a lot of circuits to it. But when you consider that the majority of the inventory in this space is LED, it actually makes a lot of sense. So uh, because I needed incandescent out there, um, I had to two for them. So we've got two channels of them out there. And right now on our house ladders, um, let's see, where does she have these drawn? On the deck layer? There. On the house ladders right now, they're set up to be uh, individually circuited. Um, but again, that's going to be something, and we've got a conductor light here. So this is one, two, three... Or, eh, they might be able to be done with one sucker pack because most of these LEDs could probably go to each other. So anyway, okay, back to the point of this whole thing. Sorry for rambling. Um, putting my Lee 71 into here. So for this, I'm, I am going to do a, a box of itself, but I'm not going to do a, a, a stage view of it because, again, they're, they're not really hitting any particular place on stage. They're kind of washing the whole thing. So I'm going to start with... I'm just going to copy-paste this guy. And I'm going to, so I need a header too, don't I? And call this Congo Fill. I do still call it Congo Fill, even though I'm not using Congo. At least 71. And I'm going to, again, I don't have a swatch for this made, so I'm just going to grab my primary blue, duplicate it, and bring that cyan back just a touch. That looks pretty Congo y to me. So now I gotta figure out how I wanna best lay these out. So again, I have two front of house units, and those are channels uh, 711 and 712. And then I've got four units coming from my ladders, or from my house ladders. So I should have, I mean, let me center this in a box so I actually have guidelines to work with. Great. So to do this, I guess, well, let's just lay it out this way and see what happens. Um, go like that. Go like that. Come on. You can see as I move this around, this is actually a good example of smart guides. So as I move this closer to this, you can see those green lines start to appear where it's, it's allowing me, I just went to point at my screen, like you can see that. Um, it's allowing me to anchor things and to align them without having to use any of the aligning tools. Um, so put this at center. Honestly, I think that might be what it is. It might be like that. And what I might do then is to denote that this is a front of house line. Um, I might make a little text box. It says balcony. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to change the size way, way, way down. I do like to try to leave my text boxes, to, even if it's small like that, to be the full width of my column because it allows me to grab things and move them really quickly and I, and I know that I've got everything centered that way. I mean, it's not really, you don't have to do it that way. I just prefer it. Um, and I also might just kind of do like a, a little dotted line type thing here just to kind of show a denotion between. A lot of times I'll do that. Uh, earlier I had that system that had some units at front of house, uh, these, these ladder color fills up here. Um, I actually probably will just go ahead and do that now, put that in. 
Eh, that's too busy. Eh. So, anyway. So, Congo fill. Now, the question becomes in this, uh, because, you know, I've got a lot of extra white space over here on the sides that I could make this smaller. Um, I'm not going to do that yet. I might do that. I might not do it. We'll have to just see how... Where the, where the magic sheet journey takes me, I think, um, over the course of the day. And again, this seems like it's taking a long time. Um, you might think, well, I've already got this stuff in Vectorworks. It's a lot faster doing Vectorworks. And that could be true for you. Um, again, it's taking a long time for me today because I'm kind of explaining everything. And I've never had to like sit and talk through everything I'm doing before. Um, I've been like, teaching programming classes. So this is, this is new for me. I'm going to put it down here for now, out of the way, and we'll, we'll get back to it later. Okay, so let's move on to our psych now. So our psych lights in this space are ETC color source linear fixtures, and we have a top row and a bottom row. The nice part about these is we're running them in multi-cell mode, so I don't have to put in like 40 fixtures, uh, you know, 40 individual numbers. I only have to put in seven in there. And then the console will do the multi-cell stuff for me. Uh, when I used to use like color blazes and or color blasts and stuff like that, I used to do um, like the, I, I would put the first number in, I'd put the center number in, and I'd put the last number in, and kind of draw arrows between to show that it's a long array of fixtures. Sometimes I'd put the quarter numbers in and stuff like that too, just to kind of help see it. But I'm happy to not have to do that. Um, let me open up actually really quickly. I can give you a better psych example. Um, I'm going to go to past shows, um, American Prom. So I just did a show out in Colorado called American Prom. It was a world premiere of a new play. Um, and we had a lot more incandescent stuff on that show. Let me open up this magic sheet real quick. Um, so in this, I had, well, there was no psych, but you can see I had a lot more colors. I had scrolls and stuff like that. Um, Trying to f I'm trying to find an example of where I'll just I'll just make it. So, if I had multiple psych colors, I would do kind of a, a, an arrayed box and, and show those colors with different fills. Actually, here's a good example. So I recently did at the end of last year, redid the rep plots for the Strata Center down in Tampa. Um, did like the first phase of that, and so I made magic sheets for those um, as well. Let's open up the Morsani Hall one. And there, unfortunately, right now, still we're still using a incandescent psych in that space. A lot of incandescent fixtures in that space. Um, hopefully in the next, uh, this part of the year, we're going to get some LEDs and I we'll get to do another redesign of it. But you can see here on my psych, I have three boxes. I have a red box, a green box, a blue box. And then each one of those boxes is like you're looking at the psych from the front. So there's a dotted line that represents that that's the ground row. I know that if I want a red center psych light, it's 305. If I want the top uh, upstage right, upstage right or, or top left corner of the psych, it's 301. Um, so just an example of that. Uh, with South Pacific, of course, since they change color, I'm just going to use the gray. Um, I should just make myself like a little rainbow object for things like that. I just don't want to have a ton of... Uh, I feel like if I put a ton of rainbow objects on here, it's going to be hard to find what I'm looking for. Um, I don't know. I'll try it sometime. So this is actually a good example. I could use this box that I made earlier of my back strips. I'm going to drop that in there for now. And I'm just going to use this as a base for my psych. Um, I'm going to ungroup that. It's a shift command G. And I'm going to change this to psych. I only say cyclorama because psych takes up less space and it looks kind of weird. Uh, ETC Color source linear four. That's not a four. Sorry, I'm typing in front of people is nerve wracking. Okay, so I only have seven units for this. So I'm going to delete these. I'm going to move this closer here. And I'm going to say this is uh, it's 301, right? Yeah, 301, 302. And 307. Okay. So now I gotta do a little bit of resizing, obviously, and this actually might look at that. So now here's a good example of when I might actually resize text a little bit. So this comes very close to fitting in one of my columns already. So in this case, I'm gonna leave the text the same size. I'm gonna drag the frames in and see how it looks. Uh, and I might I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna turn frames off. 
And to me, and this, you know, you might have a different opinion, uh, but I can still tell that these are different numbers. There's still enough white space between this for me to know that they're separate. So I'm going to go ahead and, and leave them as is. I'll turn my frame edges back on. And now I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to move this here. Like so. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Sorry. And that's my top. And I'm going to do a bottom. Whoops. Copy pasted the wrong thing. I'm going to copy paste these. So one thing I'll probably do on this, and this is something I should get better at, is I'll probably make a group 300 that is the whole psych. Because right now, obviously, I've got two... Um, two groups, the top and bottom. This is another situation where I will definitely have one group going one way, one group coming the other. So group 301 will be channels 301 through 307. Group 307 will be channels 307 through 301. Because if we want to do any kind of uh, fanning or any kind of uh, offsets or anything, it just, it's easier to have those groups already pre-built. Um, and now what I'm going to do is to show that these are separate. I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to grab that little balcony text box that I made. A lot of this is copy pasting things if you haven't been able to tell. Like there's no reason to reinvent the wheel every single time you need to put something in. Uh, it's a lot easier to create stuff once or twice and then copy paste that and just change the values in it. Um, I think that's pretty much true of any program or software that you're using in this industry. If you find that like things are taking you a really, really, really long time because you're doing the same things over and over, Start looking at ways that you can figure out uh, how to how to automate those repetitive tasks. Um, it make, makes life a lot easier. There's my top, there's my bottom. Great. So I've got my psych box built now. I'm happy with that. This stupid backstrip thing is going to be the death of me. I don't like the way it looks, but I don't know where I'm going to put it yet. So. Um, I like to leave. Oops! I like to leave the bottom right-hand side of my thing open for uh, contents. And for that, I'm really just going to come in here and I'm going to drag the previous images and stuff from this. I'm going to drop them right here. These are obviously the least important things on the piece of paper. So I will. I mean, there's been times where I don't even put magic sheet on there because. Who, you know, I mean, it's obvious what it is. If I need that space for a light, I'm going to use that space for a light. My problem here is, of course, I have my ELF logo still on there. Um, so I'm going to come into my South Pacific folder, and I've got... Where did you put it? Jess, where did you put the logo? Um, resources, probably. Oh, there it is. I'm going to take the South Pacific logo. I'm going to drag it right on top of, right on top of that ELF logo, and... Luckily, because they use the same aspect ratio and same image size, the uh, it just drops in and it's fine. So I'm all set. Um, I don't usually put like a whole bunch of design credits and director credits or anything on the magic sheet because it's really just for me uh, and for my team to use for the show. All that information is on the plot and in, in the playbill. There's no reason that it needs to be on the magic sheet too. Um, I usually will put my logo and my bug on there uh, just in case people want to know who made it. Um, okay. Back to the meat of stuff. Sorry, I keep rambling. Um, but people are still watching, so great. Uh, let's go to the cheat. No, cheat sheet. So looking at this cheat sheet now, I have uh, done my indigos. I did everything that hits people at this point. I do have, so okay, so back away, just in my site, I also have these channels here, 261 through 276, that are all to be determined. So this is kind of a... Uh, if we have the if we have the time, we're going to add these booms in. Um, and the problem is they really should be trussed because the boom is way too tall to safely support these fixtures. So, Matt, again, if you're watching, have fun figuring this out. Uh, but I've got just, these are just basically like spare ovation fixtures, and I said, well, let's throw them back there. We'll find what templates we have in stock when we get to the space, and we'll put some streaks and stuff on them. Most of the show has drops, and they're pretty beautifully painted, so I'm not super concerned with texture on the site like I normally would be. Um, and most of the, most of this psych is just being used as a bounce anyway. So, so I'm going to go drop those in, moral of the story. So 261 through 264 and uh, up to 268. So I'm going to put those... You know, in this case, I'm, I'm not even going to make a box and lay them out linearly. I'm just going to... Linearly? I'm just going to put them in 
and I'm going to say um, to be determined templates. And that's going to be uh, I forgot the numbers already. Um, 261 through 268, 261 through 268. Now you notice I just kept typing, but the box it, it overflowed. So the box will not dynamically resize. It, it's gonna because I've told this box that I want whatever content is to fit in there, it's going to show me this little red plus sign instead. So I need to actually make this box a little bit bigger uh, in order for it to work. So now I'm going to come in here. I'm going to get rid of the underlining on that part. I'm actually going to make that make the word through a little smaller too. Really, I should do this with separate boxes, but it's fine. To be determined templates 261 through 268, and that's going to be good enough for me. This doesn't need to be. So that, that saves a whole lot of space for stuff that I don't even know for sure that we're going to be using. Um, okay. Oh, and I also have 271. I also have some pars back there to do like a no color fill on it. Uh, 271 through 276. And again, I spent that time making that interesting looking box before, so now I just have to change these numbers and I'm done. Gonna make that a little smaller. So this is an example of when I'll probably start putting some bounding boxes around all of these systems because then it's obvious that this is all psych stuff. Uh, no color. Great. So my psych is now done. I'm gonna do a quick save. Once again, save often. Um, and of course, uh, if you've read some of the stuff I've written about paperwork and stuff, you'll know everything I do is in Dropbox or Google Drive, depending on the show. So when I save that, it's saved to the South Pacific uh, Dropbox folder, which is on several different computers and time machine drives. So I know that if something were to happen to my computer were to explode right now, I would have a backup of that magic sheet in like eight different places almost instantly, which is nice. Um, don't let data go away. <laughs> always always use Dropbox or Google Drive or something. Actually, Corey Paddock wrote an excellent article on uh, on Dropbox and Dropbox etiquette that I wish that I could just like casually email to every single team that I start a new show with. Um, not on my team. My team is pretty good. It's usually, it's usually the scenic team. <clears throat> anyway, um, moving on. I got the psych stuff in. I did those PARs. Show those kickers lingering into myself. Okay, so now I've got uh, these channels here, 321 through 338. Now these are these are uh, portal fills for uh, all of these portals that we have in the set. Um, actually, I'll open up the capture file of this show really quickly, and I'll show you what that's about. Um, there's these beautiful portals. The, the set we're using is is the has been rented from the Networks tour, which was based off of the Lincoln Center production from a couple years ago. Um, so, but here in Capture, as you say, I zoom around. Um, let me get rid of all of this scenery. Um, how do I do that? Oh, it's right here. Go away, please. Oh, maybe not. All right, well, it's not letting me fly things out. But you see, like, I've got these beautiful portals here. And so I wanted to be able to fill those with color. And I might, once we get on site and I see what we have in inventory gobo-wise, throw some texture in it too. But I have, uh, uh, let's see, one, two, I have 16 lights, just 16 luster twos just to light those portals. That's how important they're going to be to me because that's what's going to frame in the architecture of this entire stage. Um, so on each portal, I have a, a luster that fills in, or sorry, a series two LED luster that fills in the vertical parts of the of the towers as well as the horizontal parts. So that's four per uh, four per portal with four portals total. Wow, say that fast. Okay, so that's capture. Um, so to do that, I'm probably just gonna let's see. I'm gonna lay these out. Like this, really. I've got I've got these boom head this boom head box that I made already. I'm gonna copy paste this, put it down here, out of the way, and I'm gonna call this portal leg fills. And 
honestly, that's pretty good where it is. I'm, I don't need arrows for this because they're just going straight down. And you know what? I'm not even going to do a background for this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a double, I'm going to change this to portal fills. And I'm going to have two boxes. I'm going to have one box or one column over here for legs. And I'm going to have another column. I'm going to have another column for the headers. Great. Um, so this is one example of, of, of a change to that rule that I said earlier. I am going to make this a half width box, a text box. Now, I, I, sh I will do that. I won't do like quarter widths and stuff like that unless they're evenly spaced. I, I, the goal here is to not have an arbitrarily sized text box because it becomes hard to align. So this is going to be legs. And this is going to be headers. And I'm going to make those that text just a little bit bigger. So again, I'm making the frame a little bit bigger first. And then I'm going to come in here and change my text size. Because if I change the text size first, it'll just wrap around and I won't be able to see it. And it just is an extra step. So I like doing this here. LED. And I'm going to center these underneath their respective channel blocks. Great. And then my channel numbers were, OK, so if the legs, they go, see, these are numbered the same way I did my booms. So they go stage right first, starting with 321. So I'm just going to come in here. And again, because I use the same kind of numbering, all I have to do is change the middle digit in all of these, six, seven, eight. And oh, that's the wrong document. Uh, the headers, uh, those start with 331. So it's, again, same thing. I'm going to do, oh, it's two numbers. Nobody corrected me on that. All right, 341. And now here's an example of when I'm going to save a little bit of time. I'm just going to delete these. I'm going to copy paste these over. And now I only have to change one number instead of changing can't get it to a line there. Instead of having to change both numbers, I'm just changing one number. So now I can come in here and just go bloop, 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 bloop. Uh, if I end up adding a gobo to this on site, then I can just drop a little gobo image in the center of it, uh, which would be pretty cool. Um, I don't know if it's cool. I don't know why I said that. I think it's cool. It'll look nice. That's a better way to put it. And this damn backstrip box here is still just floating. Now, maybe I'll just align it in between these two and leave it there for now. Okay, so portal fills are done. Um, I've got drop fills on the front of house positions. So that's 351, 352. These were those two other lusters that you saw out on the balconies earlier. Um, so like I said, there's a lot of drops and you know I've got a lot of stuff to fill them in, including you know two framing shutter moving lights out there. But you never know when you need that extra little bit of a color punch or, you know, I might even throw a breakup in it just to give it a little extra something. So that's these two, 351, 352. And again, there's no reason that that needs to take up an entire box in itself. So I'm just gonna grab them, 351, did I say 351? I'm sorry, I'm bad at numbers, I'm in the wrong profession. Uh, 352, there. And I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna say drop fills, and I'm gonna make this a half width box because there's no reason that two instruments need to take up an entire space there. Usually, all this little stuff I save and put it down towards the bottom of the sheet here. Um, like that. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to put that there. I'm also going to put in <laughs> Yeah, it is the wrong profession to be bad at numbers, Trey. Uh, I'm going to call them with my house lights in. I'm not bad at numbers. I like numbers. I think it's more, I just, I because there are so many numbers, I just, I often forget. And I think that's another reason why it's important to come up with a numbering scheme that works for you and stick with it. You know, if I was doing a different channel numbering scheme for every single show that I do, I would, I, I mean, the, the programmers already hate me enough 
um, I would, I would, they would hate me so much because I would be saying the wrong numbers left and right. Um, I, you know, I, I don't mean this to be like in a braggy way, but I'm doing like I'm doing six shows or sorry, five shows between now and mid-April, and all of those things are all in doing paperwork at the same time. I'm going into tech back after back after back after back on them, and so the only way I can do that with with keeping things straight and keeping things orderly is by using the same systems and using the same paperwork and doing things the same way over and over. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily using the same colors on every show, but it means that I know that my top cool light is always going to be channel one. I know that my first front cool light is always going to be channel 101, and I can walk from space to space and from theater to theater, sometimes multiple theaters within a week, and not have to re relearn an entire channel numbering system. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of why I, I stick with these numbers. Um, there are certain things I've adjusted over the years. Um, I've been asked by programmers to change things a couple of times, and I have, I have tried to do that as best as possible. Um, it really just depends on the, the place. Uh, anyway, uh, conductor and a nine. Great. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so Trey just said if you're if you're not on the live chat, um, you're on tour. It's the same numbers for nine months. You know, if you were if you were going on tour and you were changing your numbers from venue to venue depending on the house rig, and not just repatching your show, you would you would want to tear your hair out or whatever hair I have left in my case. Um, so yeah, so coming up with, again, it goes back to coming up with systems that work for you, uh, and you know your numbering is a system that works for you. And uh, yeah, great. Okay, so I now have my drop fills in. I have my back linear wash. I'm not going to touch moving lights yet. I'm not going to touch that yet. I've got strobes that I'm honestly probably not going to use. Um, let's see here. Got sconces, practicals. Okay, so really I think all that's left is my practicals and my um, and my moving lights, and I actually think that I have enough enough space on this magic sheet to put moving lights in. Um, I've got a lot of open white space here that, that is left. Um, so for practicals, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a text box and just kind of fill in this space here. I'm not going to make a box for every single fixture. Actually, I'm going to go through here. Like I've got oh, I guess I did those as individual boxes. That's annoying. Why did I do that? Um, I'm just going to copy paste this. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm going to copy-paste two things. And I'm going to put those down here. And I'm just going to have a little practical section. This has been fun because the, the documentation package we had for this show didn't really list any of the practicals. Uh, it listed a couple of them. So like we knew about some of them. And so the, 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 the cast has been very lucky where they got the rental package for this uh, at the beginning of their rehearsal period. So they've had all of the scenery in their rehearsal room for them for a couple, for like two weeks now, which is wonderful. But what that meant is as they were, un as the production manager and, and team were unpacking the scenery, we just kept getting pictures of all of these different practicals that they were unpacking. Like we found out the washing machine tumbles, um, which is great. It's going to be really cool, but we had no idea. Um, we also don't really know how some of them work yet, so it's going to be a fun weekend is what I'm getting at. The show, the shows we do at City Springs are very, very tight turnaround times, so we get in, um, I get in to town on Friday to set up previs, and then Dalton, my, my programmer, and I will be, will be prevising all weekend. Uh, they don't start loading in until Monday, so Monday, I guess, would be week from tomorrow and then we open the show Friday night so it's we doing a full-scale musical in a week uh, so that previous time comes in in handy um, a lot a lot a lot all right hanging lamps Wait, six on one. Uh, sorry I mean I have multiple monitors but I'm trying to keep everything on one monitor so you can all see it and it's annoying to, to use mission control there so much uh, 601 is follows follies and then 611 is my practicals okay so for this, again, like I'm just putting these numbers in here so I have them. Um, a lot of times, you know, it, this is this kind of goes to having a great programmer. Um, Dalton is an amazing programmer, and we, we speak the same language a lot. So a lot of the times I get to the point where I don't need these numbers. Um, as a designer, it's always, for me at least, it's always preferable to be able to, to not have to look at a magic sheet and give specific numbers or to not, 
you know, read out channel numbers. I want to be able to say, hey, I want, you know, that backlight, I want that to be this, I want that to be that. And I want the programmer to be able to help and be a designer themselves. And that's why I love working with Dalton. Because um, I'll notice, you know, as we're going through stuff, he'll be touching up a moving light palette without me even saying anything or without the associate saying anything. And it's just wonderful. Versus the programmers who you're just feeding button commands to, which is not fun. Because then I'm, I'm spending more time in that situation um, sometimes teaching somebody how to use a console than I am actually designing the show, and I'm, my eyes are glued to a command line instead of the stage, which is not where I want them to be. Um, sorry, I'm clicking around here a lot. Uh, okay, so I've got my washing machine, I've got Christmas lights, or 614. I'm just going to move this off to the side so that I don't have to keep flashing it across your screens like that. Um, and then I've got sconces. So right now we've got sconces as four separate channels. I don't think that's going to happen. So that's the other thing. Like I, I noticed, like that's something I didn't catch when we were doing the paperwork revisions, that there's these sconces on the wall, and they're currently channeled as four separate channels, which of course, you know, I always want as much channel as, as much control as possible. But also knowing the limitations of the space and in the time, um, I'm going to make the decision now as I'm making this magic sheet, we're going to put them all as one channel because they're all going to be on at the same time every single time. Um, and then that will just kind of get relayed through the chain and then the other paperwork will get updated accordingly. Okay, so that's all my practicals. I've got my conductor in there, I've got my house lights. Uh, I've got, I'm not even going to put haze on here because again that's something that, that Dalton the programmer will deal with. Um, you know, that's, that's again, that's why I, I love working with Dalton, I love working with great programmers because I don't want to have to think about that. I want to be able to say, hey, I need haze running, you know, and then say, okay, I got that and I don't have to like show them how to create a secondary queue list and do all those kinds of things. I just, I like, I like working with people who can do that. Uh, and I shouldn't, and I, I, I don't mean to say that I don't, I, I have no problem helping somebody with stuff. I just, especially with a time crunch like this, it's much better to have, have somebody like Dalton. Okay, so let's work on moving lights. Um, let's see, how did I do them in Elf? I did a separate page, did I? No, I didn't. So on moving lights on Elf, I just did, uh, I just did boxes. Um, I didn't do, you know, on some of them, if I go to the American Prom Magic Sheet, um, you can see I put my moving light gobos in there for those. I actually had, I think for American Prom as well, I had a, uh, I had a separate magic sheet just for color changers. There's a lot of scrollers in that show. Yeah, I did. I have a moving, moving lights and scrollers magic sheet where I just had, you know, pixel mapping zones. I had my gobos. I'm not going to do that for this. The only real reason is because I, I know what gobos are in the moving lights and because Dalton has a, a great EOS magic sheet that he'll make that will have that information for me where I can see it on the screen. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm not going to I'm not going to worry about that. So what I am going to do, though, is I'm going to come in here to my top LED box. And I'm going to paste it down here. And now in looking at this, before I do that, actually, I'm going to delete that. So I'm going to start thinking about this as in terms of logical flow of how I'm going to light the show. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to put the moving lights kind of out here in the middle of everything. Usually when I'm doing something like this, I'm either going to start with the moving lights or I'm going to do the moving lights last. So I'm going to want them either to be at the front of the magic sheet or the back of the magic sheet. So I think what I'm actually going to do for this is I'm going to move all of this stuff, all of this boom stuff here, I'm going to move it over to here. I gotta get a new mouse. I can't zoom sideways on this mouse. It's super sensitive. Um, I'm gonna move all that over there. I'm gonna move the stupid these backstrip boxes gonna be the death of me. Um, I'm gonna move my portal fill stuff. I'm gonna put it down here towards the bottom for now. I'm gonna put my psych stuff down here towards the bottom. Um, and Tell you what, because I'm going to probably use these back strips more than I'm going to use. Whoops! Because I'm going to use the back strips more than I'm going to move use the booms. I'm going to finally find a home for this stupid, stupid section right here, and I'm going to make it double width, and I'm going to call that good enough. Now, if you notice that when I when I dragged that group, you see what happened here to my uh, my arrows? They got messed up inside their frame. So I'm actually going to undo that. I'm going to ungroup everything. I'm going to select everything, and I'm going to hold down Shift and deselect my arrows. And now I'm going to drag this to be a little bit wider, 
like so. And then I'll just, again, I'm going to redo these arrows later when everybody's not watching me. Honestly, I probably won't. I'm too lazy. Okay. Um, great. So, so to me, that, made, that looks a lot better. Like, I spent a lot of time being angry at that back strip group, and now all of a sudden I found a spot that it seems to work well, and I'm going to be happy with that. Um, I do have extra white space that I don't like here, so I'm just going to move this stuff up. And I like to keep my house and conductor stuff down here by the title block, so I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to move these practical things here. I'm going to move my drop fills down over here. The reason I'm putting it over to the side like this is so I can make sure I have it aligned. Once I've dropped it in, I'm going to hold down shift and move it over. Like that. And that's good enough. Okay, and I'm gonna move this side down. No, I'm not gonna leave it up. Okay, so now I have a space that makes a little bit more logical sense to put my moving lights. If I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm lighting a show from this, I've got all of my top and side stuff across the top. I've got fronts and, and more kind of side stuff across the second row. All my front of house box room stuff is in one section. My Congo fill stuff is in one section. All of my backlight, my booms, all that kind of stuff is all in one section. So it makes kind of a logical sense and the flow makes sense for how it, how it, how it works all on the screen. So let's go ahead and recopy paste this guy up here. So in all these boxes that we've made so far, um, they are all, you know, they're, they're showing, other than the booms, they're showing where the lights are focused. The moving lights obviously move, and so I'm going to be actually, I'm going to be drawing them where they are in space versus where they're focused to because they'll be focused in different places. And I don't need arrows for that. Uh, so I'm going to say Sola 1000 Spot. I know there's Sola, Sola Spot 1000. Um, the venue at this space is awesome. There's a ton of Sola Spot 1000s, there's Sola Theaters. Um, There's uh, a bunch of R2 washes, just all kinds of stuff. It's, it's great. Um, and then we usually rent a little bit as well um, to supplement. So on this, um, this moving light grid is pretty simple. Um, it's three rows deep by four across, and they're symmetrically hung. Um, South Pacific is not really a big, you know, flashy show. There's going to be a lot of just beautiful static looks. There'll be some motion, but I, I'm not concerned with seeing, you know, moving light beams and seeing cones and stuff like that. If I was, if it was a show like Elf where we did a lot of aerial stuff and a lot of, you know, geometry and, and uh, architecture in the air, I would stagger these spots so that they kind of be in windows uh, between each other. So I'd be able to see that a little bit more. For this, these spots are going to be used really as specials, as template washes, as things like that. And they won't be doing much, um, much in the way of, of flash and trash type stuff. So 501 through 512, three rows, four deep. So I've got this here. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to delete you guys. I'm going to delete these. Again, I'm deleting those because I already have these italicized, so I'm saving some time. I'm just gonna shoot those in. And I'm gonna put this centered. And again, this isn't exactly a perfect representation of where they are in space. Uh, you know, they are probably a little bit more close together, they're not spread out, but it's giving me a, a good a good visual representation of where where they are. I know I just said a contradicting thing, but hopefully you I don't know that I'm going to watch this. I feel like I'm going to be too embarrassed to watch this and hear my, hear my voice the whole time. I'm still amazed that there's still so many of you watching this. Okay. 511, 512. Okay. Great. So now in this particular case, uh, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn my frame edges back off for a second. So again, that's extras, hide frame edges. And these are a little close together to me. Um, the psych didn't bother me as much. These I'm going to space out. So to do that, I'm going to grab the centermost ones first, and I'm going to hit the left arrow key once, and then I'm going to deselect these ones, and I'm going to hit the left arrow key again. Do the same thing here with the right arrow key. Now, there are all kinds of aligning and distributing tools with this, but you know I just find it easier sometimes just to click and drag, or to click and use the arrows. Turn my frame edges back on. Um, and again, I've got this extra space up there I'm not using. I'm just going to get rid of that in the frame. I'm going to move this up to here. 
Great, so there's my solos 1000s. Take that, copy, paste it, put it right here. This is going to become my R2 washes, which they're okay. Um, I'm excited. We're, you know, they're the. I think the optics on them. There's a lot of spill. I've tried to use them in a front of house position, kind of as a boxy kind of thing, and they just spill all over. And the yokes are so tight that there's you can't even do like a black wrap top hat or anything to control it. Um, they're they're fine. Um, anyway, I'm excited. We're doing hairspray later in the year with them, and I'm going to probably try to use some of them in multi pixel and multi cell mode and see what I can do with them. So in these and my top system. Um, so here's, okay, so let me back up for a second. So in the R2s I have in several different systems. I have a top system of R2s, which will be a top wash system. And then I also have them on my ladders. Um, the ladders, uh, the ladders are going to be like, the, it's like a really low color fill. Um, almost at head level. I think they're like eight feet off the ground, like just enough so scenery can move around them. Um, but I want to show those in different boxes because they're different. Technically, even though they're the same instrument, they're different systems. So I'm going to do the top ones first. I have three across by four deep this time. So it's the opposite of what I had with my uh, solo spots. Um, so again, I'm going to delete this, this, this. I'm going to move these closer to center. I'm going to center everything. Move these down a little bit. And I'm just going to give myself one more row, like so, and re-space these out again a little bit more. And so these start with 521, 522, that's funny. This was uh, Jess actually, when we were doing channel numbers on this plot, she asked me if I would be willing to change my numbering so that my moving lights would start with lower digits because it would save time for the programmer. And it's honestly something I hadn't really thought of before. Um, and I think I'm going to try to do that in the future. The problem for me right now is that uh, I'm, I do a lot of shows with mixed systems, and you know the shows I do in Atlanta have a lot of moving lights. But you know, in December I did a production of Elf that had 60 moving lights, and then a week later I was in Chattanooga doing a show that had no moving lights, and it was like 40 incandescent dimmers. So going back to the idea of like having systems that work for you. Um, that's why I'm hesitant to change to that because I want to be able to go from theater to theater. And if I have LEDs that have moving lights, great. If I don't, great. The numbering still stays the same. So we'll see. We'll see how it happens. They're going to try to convert me, I think. But I'm going to resist as long as I can. Okay. Back to the uh, thingy here, the cheat sheet. Um, side washes. Let's do those next. Um, Yeah, that's a good that's a good point, Luther. Um, and I think that that's true. So Luther just pointed out when you have moving lights, you know, 60, 70 moving lights, you know, you don't type numbers. You're using direct selects, groups, presets, stuff like that. Um, and that's very true. Uh, I find that would be true if I was programming a lot of my own stuff or you know busking and stuff like that. Uh, when I, it's funny because when I when I use an EOS, I'm almost always in the keys. Even with a touch screen, I just I'm I'm fast on the command line. I, I use the keys. When I was on an MA this week, um, I very very rarely touched the keys. I was using I was you know I was using Drex or pools. I was using all kinds of stuff on the MA, and I like that a lot. Um, and I think that when, and I, and I know Dalton does a system, he's got magic sheets that he makes uh, with all the movers and uses direct selects and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I was I was blown away by what I could do on the MA this week, which I know it's 2019 and me saying that is ridiculous, but, you know, it, we all have to learn sometime. So. Okay, so back to this, uh, 541 through 548. These are my R2 washes on the side. So... I am going to put these the R2 washes directly the side R2 washes directly beneath the top R2 washes. The reason for that again, just kind of logical flow. If I if I see the word R2 wash, um, I'm going to want to be able to get to it really quickly. And if I have them in different areas, it's going to be confusing. So I'm actually going to put top here. I'm going to put side here. Now on this, I have four deep by uh, two wide because they're again. This is a this is another boom type scenario where they are. I'm going to show. Well, I guess it's the same thing. I'm moving. I'm going to show where they are and not where they're pointed. Um, and I'm actually going to come over here to my booms. And I'm going to bring my arrows back in just for some extra clarity. Put them right there, like 
like so. Great. And those are five, do, 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 what are those? Five forties. So those are in the five forties. And again, uh, not to harp on the channel numbering too much again, but you can kind of see again how, how my channel numbering system makes sense to me. Oh, this is already two hours, I'm sorry. Again, I should stop saying the same things over and over, but if you're doing this, you know, if I was doing this without explaining it, I would have been done an hour and a half ago. So I don't want people to sit and think, well, why would I ever spend the amount of time doing this that it's taking? Because this takes way too long. Um, it doesn't once you get once you get into it a bit. Um, okay, so I've got two more sets of moving lights, and I think that's about it. Uh, I've got solar frame theaters at front of house. That's 551 through 556. And I have these Alation Artiste Picassos, uh, which I haven't used yet. Um, long story short on those, they were supposed to be solar frame theaters, then the venue wouldn't let us bring two of them down from their front of house rep position. Um, and then I was going to put BMFLs out there, or VL4000s, or something bigger and brighter. But again, power becomes an issue. And so we're talking, you know, putting a PD in, running L620, all of that all up to the balcony for two fixtures for this show didn't really make sense. So Four Wall had some Picassos available. I said, all right, let's 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 do that. Um, and I'm going to try them out. I haven't used them yet. Um, I'm a little worried about brightness, but all they're really going to be doing in the show is filling drops and textures and stuff. So I think they'll probably be okay. Um, Tyler, if you're watching this, please give me some Solo 3000s in Nashville. I really want some Solo 3000s. Okay. Um, so let's do my Solo Theaters. Okay, so this is another situation where I don't need a diagram on my stage because there's six of them and they're all coming in from the same angle. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, that's a lot of moving lights to just put on a catwalk arbitrarily, and you'd be right. My goal for this is to talk to the production manager. If, if you're watching, uh, don't listen. I'm going to try to talk you into uh, letting us move two of them to the balcony permanently. So the situation with this theater company is that we have... Um, it's a brand new company. This is going to be our third show. Uh, and we are kind of like in residence at this Performing Arts Center. So they have a deal with the Performing Arts Center where we use the space and everything. Um, but because of that, you know, they have a rep plot. They have uh, they have stuff in there all the time. That's also one of the reasons we don't have a lot of time in the space. Um, so a lot of that, you know, we're, we're taking into account those things when, even when we're designing the plot. I'll, I'll choose a fixture that it might not be as crazy about because I know it's going to save three hours of load-in time, which directly correlates to labor hours, which correlates to programming time that we have. Um, so sometimes you have to make those decisions. Okay. 551, 552. Okay. So that's Solar Theaters. And now my final moving lights. I'm actually really surprised I have as much white space as I do on this um, towards the bottom here. I thought I was going to have uh, I thought I was going to have more, not enough space. And this actually I noticed was a it was an error in the channeling. So if you see on the cheat sheet here, it's five sixty one, five sixty three. Originally we had three units, and we deleted the center one, and someone didn't change the numbers. <clears throat> It's okay, I forgive you. Uh, 561 and 562. So you see I'm just doing the outside boxes there. I'm going to delete the center ones. Oh, and like that. Save that. Oh, and I actually remembered about my shins that I, for, that I said I needed to remember. So I'm going to grab this drop fill box. I'm going to take it here. Say shin pick. And this was what channels? This was channels. Two ninety one, two ninety two. And let's zoom out and figure out where we want to put that box. Um, you know what? I'm actually I need something to space the psych out. I'm gonna move the psych to the bottom because it makes sense, right? It's at the back. Forgot two little boxes there. And now I'm going to move the shin kickers up here underneath my booms, where my shins were. 
Um, and I'm going to leave them, I think I'm going to leave it smaller like that, too. Great, great, great. I'm going to space these out a little bit, too, so it's clear that they're a separate thing. Um, and I think the only other thing I have that I haven't put in is my strobe lights, right? Wow, I think so. And we cut the footlights. Okay. We cut the footlights because we had, we didn't have enough instruments. I'm going to miss them, but somehow I will live. I'm just going to grab that same box again, put it right here. Strobes, and those are stormies. Again, the only thing we're renting for this show, <laughs> crazy enough, are those two Picasso units, and we're renting some hardware and some lenses. Um, all of this other gear you see is in in the house inventory, which is awesome. Um, it's not very often I walk into a space like that where I just get to play around with a bunch of cool stuff. Okay. Um, well, that's about it. Let's let's do the exporting process real quick. Um, again, I'm going to come in here real quick. I'm going to turn off uh, my got my frame edges so I can just kind of see what this looks like. Um, I'm going to leave the arrows as is for now, uh, just for time's sake, because I'm not. You don't need to sit and watch me. You've already watched me do a lot of this. You don't need to sit and watch me edit arrows. Um, so that's it. I mean, this is, I don't like how this is aligned. So let me do this. Let me put house light there. Here's a good example. I'm going to grab all of these and I'm going to use this align tool for the first time on this demo. So I'm align them to center. And I'm going to put these things over here. I'm going to put that there. My conductor lights right here. Like that. Um, if I was, if I had, well, I have follow spots in this, I would put follow spot colors and stuff in here, but um, my associate designer on this, Abby, is going to be doing follow spots, so I'm not even going to really think about it. Um, I'm just going to let that be on her stuff, um, and I'm just going to have to deal with some white space, which I hate. I hate white space, but actually I think it would make sense to move the practicals over here, too. And the drop fills underneath the portal fills. And then I'm going to move this stuff down a little bit. So now I kind of, again, I'm just seeing how it all looks laid out on a piece of paper. And I think that's going to work for me. Um, I am almost positive that there's going to be a mistake somewhere on here. Um, so if you see one, throw it in the comments. Um, or, you know, don't tell me and let me suffer. That's fine, too. Um, let's go ahead and do the export. So now I've got this saved. I'm going to save the, the InDesign document. I'm going to go to File, Export. Um, for the most part, you don't need to change any settings anywhere. Um, everything kind of just works. Um, if you wanted to do, you could do some stuff with, with colors and with bleeds and all kinds of stuff, depending on how in-depth you're getting. Um, I just do Adobe PDF print. All the settings that work there seem to work just fine for me. Um, and I'm going to put that uh, in my public folder under Paperwork. South Pacific Magic Sheet save. Now it's going to give you some other options. So this is if I had multiple pages, it's going to tell me what pages I want. If I'm going to do bleeds or crop marks or anything like that. I'm not going to worry about any of that for this. I'm just going to say high quality print. I'm going to say export. And then I'm going to go to my folder here. Not American Prom, South Pacific. I'm going to open up my Magic Sheet in Acrobat, and there it is. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a Magic Sheet. Um, that's it. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully somebody learned something from that. Um, I'll hang out for a couple minutes and answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, but hopefully this was informative in some way. Um, and I'm going to try to do more of these with other things and I'll try to get better at it so I'm not rambling as much and I'm uh, not, not answering questions that weren't asked. But yeah, so yeah, anybody else have any questions? Okay, cool. Uh, well, again, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, this video will be available. Um, oh, there's a question. Uh, so, okay, so there's not going to be any new information. If you've been here the whole time, you're welcome to go. Uh, the, this video will be up on my uh, YouTube channel probably in a couple hours after it's done processing. Um, so feel free to check that out. I also wrote a blog post about this whole process on my website, which you can find uh, as well. Uh, so James Dorkerson asked a question. Uh, Joy Late, what are the arrows for? Let me turn my camera back off here.
I love this program. This is really cool. Um, so the arrows basically just show direction. Um, uh, they show the direction of, of where the lights are pointed. So in this particular case, I didn't, I, I'm going to go back and kind of fix these arrows a little bit to make them a little bit nicer looking. Um, I just didn't want to bore everybody with that. But if we go back to a different magic sheet, you get a better idea. So this one is from American Prom, which is a show I just did. Um, this just shows where the, the lights are coming from, what direction they're pointing. Um, really, it, that coupled with the color bars that I have, it's a quick way for me to see what lights I have and where they're going. So I, I might not remember exactly where my upstage front cool fill light was, but I see uh, I see a um, I see an arrow. I can find it quickly there. Um, oh, Trey found a mistake. I'll go fix that in a second. Uh, real quick here. So these these uh, these scroll images that you see here for this American Prom sheet, these were done in Lightrite. Um, it, uh, so I, I just exported the, the image. In fact, if I come in here and I move it around, I'm, if I make this frame bigger, you can see that that's the light right document behind there. Uh, and I just drop text boxes over top of it with the information. Um, okay, let me go back to the thing here. Trey pointed out a mistake that I made in my first ladder low par. To, to, ah, good catch, thank you. Perfect. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, question, do I use the same typeface for all my paperwork? Yeah, I pretty much do. Um, this here is uh, Helvetica. I love Helvetica. I think it looks great. Um, I use Helvetica for pretty much all of my stuff that I create on my computer. In my paperwork program, which I'm not going to get super into on this live stream, that should be a different <laughs> live stream altogether, I use a mix of Helvetica and, and Arial. Um, just because Helvetica is not a Windows font, um, I think you have to pay for it to have it on Windows. Um, or no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Futura. I use a lot of Futura in my drafting, and that's only a Mac font. Um, but yeah, I, I, I keep similar typefaces. I kind of like, I mean, it sounds dumb, I guess, but I, I like having kind of a brand to my, my paperwork to where it all looks the same. Um, so you can like look at a piece of paperwork and know that it's one of mine, which again, it sounds really dumb when I say it out loud, but it's just kind of something that I've always done and I've kind of refined over the years um, to where I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way things look. Um, and my paperwork program that I use uh, does the similar thing. All of my reports look exactly the same. So. All right. Thank you, Luther. I will see you uh, sometime soon. Hopefully more than Luther and I uh, have known each other for a while, but we see each other like once a year at the ETC parties in New York. Seems to be the New York way, almost. But. Okay, Ben says 212. Oh, look at that. You know what? I should do a live stream for every magic sheet that I make so people can error check me as I go. This has been, <laughs> that's been the most helpful thing. Thank you, Ben. Um, okay, so I've got a couple more minutes um, before I need to go do other things. So if anybody else has any questions about this or anything uh, paperwork related, uh, feel free. Also, if you have any ideas for other things you'd like to see as far as a, a live stream type thing goes, I would love to try to do like like a queuing session live stream where I set it up where you can see the console, you can hear the comm, things like that. But that's not going to happen for a while um, because it's that's a lot to set up. But I'm going to kind of experiment and see what other things I can think of. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll hang out, let's say, for another three or four minutes for questions. Um, if you've got any, shoot them to the, shoot them to the chat on YouTube. I'm just re-exporting again um, with those changes that we made. All right, last call for any questions. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. Oh, yeah. Um, I've thought about doing the plot thing. Uh, the problem is, is that I very rarely sit down. Uh, it, it's actually been very hard for me to sit and do this in one session, even just the magic sheet. Um, when I do a plot, uh, if I'm drafting it myself, I will typically work on it in little chunks over time. Um, but I, I think that would be fun. Um, I, I do it with I, I do you know a vector work set thing with my classes. Sorry, not cl like my actual classes that I teach on my vector works classes. Um, 
So maybe I could try to modify that. I also would like to try to do, I do a lot of speaking at like thespian conventions and, and schools and stuff. So next time I do that, if there's a reliable Wi-Fi, I'm going to try to live stream some of my sessions. Um, I can't, I don't know when or where that'll be, um, but I'm going to try to do it. But yeah, to answer your question, yes, I think doing a, a plot one would be really cool. Um, cool and nerdy. But Thanks, James. I appreciate that. Yeah, I love... Um, you know, the reason I, I do this and I like to share everything is because I didn't really get that. Um, I, I know there's probably a mix of people watching from, from high schoolers to college students to professionals to people who might have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, and, I, and I think that's really cool. Um, I didn't get a lot of this kind of instruction when I was starting out and when I was in school. And uh, so I make it a point to, to try to share what I can with, with whoever wants to see it. Um, I'm a strong believer that this this business can really suck if you don't really love it and don't really want to do it. And um, a lot of times in a lot of schools, uh, you know, you don't get to see the real world. You don't get to see, you know, what goes into it. You don't get to see the behind the scenes of the tech process and things like that. And so I try to share that. Um, I also try to do, uh, I do, I do have an internship program that I kind of run. Um, and, you know, the word intern makes me cringe a little bit because um, when you hear intern, you think, oh, it's just somebody working for free. Um, but what I do with that internship program is, is it really is, uh, you know, an educational program. I, I, if, if you're a student and you're I'm in a city that you're working in and you want to come out and sit in on tech, shoot me an email. We'll make it happen. You know, we give you a headset. We'll let you plug your laptop in with Nomad so you can see what's happening. You don't do any work. Like I never, I'm very, I feel very strongly about, uh, you know, bringing in unpaid people to take uh, crew jobs away, take paid jobs away. So I'll never ask you to do any work. Um, but, you know, uh, somebody who's been commenting, Ben, um, who's, a, who's a student at a from art school in Florida, he's been coming out for the last several years on the park show I do. Um, and I think it's just really an invaluable experience. You get to, you know, one night you could shadow the programmer, one no night you can sit with me, one night you could hang out with the electricians. And it's just a great way to learn um, and to see how things work um, in, the, in the real world or my version of the real world, which I've been told often is not the real world. That's fine. Oh, I found a mistake. Uh, my ladder cools are actually coming in from the other direction. So. Uh, do you have a time of time symmetry? Um, uh, the question is, the double template image on the high side temp systems, is it just for symmetry or does it have another purpose? Uh, no, I just like it because it's symmetrical. Um, I guess I could change it. I, you know, I didn't really ever think of it before. Oh, here's another mistake. This, these ladder, These arrows also need to change direction. So, you know, I, I played around with the idea earlier in the in the process of, you know, making this just one wide header with arrows. If I did that, I'd probably just put one big gobo on, but I, I'm fine with it just being the double image. There's not really a reason to it. Um, okay, last chance for any other questions, and then I am going to sign off because I need water. All right, everybody, thanks again uh, for watching. Um, if you have, do you have any questions you think of, please feel free to comment them on there or come check me out on Instagram. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all again for the next one. Hope everybody has a good weekend. Good week.